The Royal Commission is now resumed. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we begin, as we do with all our hearings, with an acknowledgement of country. I wish to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Iora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, on which I uh, and Commissioner Ryan are uh, located. I also acknowledge the Turbal and Jagera Nations, upon whose lands our hearing room is located and where Commissioner Atkinson is uh, sitting and uh, the uh, uh, Warawindari people of the Kulin Nation, upon whose lands Commissioner Gelbel in Melbourne is uh, located. I pay my respects to uh, the, their elders, past, present and emerging, as well as to all First Nations people who may be viewing this hearing on the live stream. Yes, uh, Ms Eastman. Uh, good morning, Commissioners, and good morning to everyone following the proceeding today. Our witnesses this morning uh, will be taken from my colleagues in Brisbane. Ms Fraser will take our first witness today, who I can see is ready, Jess Mitchell, and then Ms Zerner will uh, introduce you two and take our second witness, Oliver Collins, also from Brisbane. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming to the uh, Royal Commission in order to give uh, evidence. If you would be good enough uh, to follow uh, you or Liz, to follow the instructions of my associate, uh, she will administer the affirmation to you. Thank you very much. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you very much. Uh, if you would be good enough uh, now to uh, listen to Ms Fraser, who will ask you some questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioners, we will now take the evidence of Jess Mitchell. Jess, you provided a statement to the Commission dated 27 November 2020. Yes. And you have a copy of that statement with you now? Yes. Are there any corrections or amendments that you'd like to make to the statement? No. And you're familiar with the contents of the statement? Yes. And it's true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes. Commissioners, you will find a copy of Jess's statement in Tender Bundle Part A, Volume 1, at Tab 24, I ask that Jess's statement be tendered into evidence and marked Exhibit 9.13. Yes, that Jess, can be. You are... Thank you, Commissioner. Jess, you are here today on behalf of Children and Young People with Disability Australia, or SIDA. That's correct, isn't it? Yes. And you're employed by SIDA as a youth storytelling and development officer. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about what your role involves? My role involves um, engaging in facilitation and project work and also doing research and data analysis. So anything, I guess, the way I would summarise it is finding out what those stories are and then telling them. <laughs> that's great because that's exactly what you're here to do today. <laughs> uh, Jess, you have a bachelor's degree in social science and an honours degree in psychology? Yes, that's correct. And while you are here today on behalf of CIDA, you yourself are a young person living with psychosocial disability and neurodiversity, aren't you? Yes, that's correct. And Jess, before we move to address the evidence that you will give today, particularly in relation to the 2020 National Youth Disability Summit, you would like to acknowledge the privilege that you feel as a young person speaking professionally at this hearing. Yes, um, as a young person living with disability myself, I feel quite honoured to talk about the themes discussed at the National Youth Disability Summit 2020. And a lot of these themes really resonated with me on a personal level based on my own lived experience. And I want to acknowledge um, my privilege in speaking about them and to clearly state that I am not immune to the issues that were discussed within the summit. And as such, I feel very privileged to speak on the path of the young people who attended the summit and to help elevate their voices towards change at this hearing. Thanks, Jess. 
Um, Jess, the Commission has the benefit of having received your very detailed submission about the summit. While we only have time today to touch on some of the issues raised, your statement does provide um, the views of participants and it does so um, with considerable uh, detail, um, identifying a number of issues raised at the summit, including ADEs. Mm -hmm. um, for the purpose of today, we are going to be focusing on um, employment. The summit, that, uh, sorry, the statement that you prepared contains a number of uh, quotes provided by summit participants, doesn't it? Yes. And the people that have provided these quotes, some of which you will speak to today, have provided their authority for you to um, provide the quotes to us, haven't they? Yes, they provided authority for us to use it in any of our policy or advocacy work. Great. Um, Jess, I would now like to move, if you're happy for me to do so, I would like to move to ask you some questions in relation to the 2020 National Youth Disability Summit, which you and I have agreed for today's purpose, we will refer to as simply the summit. Yep, Otherwise, we might use some considerable time in simply stating the, uh, the title of the summit several times. Yep. Can you um, briefly explain the summit to me? Yes, the summit was co-designed by 20 young people from all across Australia um, over a course of eight months from January to September. And it was the culmination of that co-design was agreed to have a five day online summit that would cover themes such as education, employment, NDIS and housing, mental health and wellbeing and awareness, access and inclusion. Overall, 250 young people from all around Australia tuned into the summit online. And for the purposes of the summit, um, the co-design committee identified that it was important to extend the age range of what most people traditionally think of as youth um, to be from 15 to 30. There were two reasons this decision was made. One being that it was acknowledged that young people um, who would have live with a disability often have their youth sort of stagnated or lengthened due to the challenges um, they experienced due to their disability. And um, for this reason, they may not have fully transitioned into adulthood um, by the age of 25, like most people anticipate young people will. And also the young, the co-design committee thought it was important that this national, the summit was the first of its kind um, in Australia, an event like this and brought together young people with disability. And as such, we didn't, they didn't want anyone to miss out who may not have had the opportunity to have something like that when they were perhaps 18, just because they were a little bit older. And um, Jess, what were the nature of disabilities that were represented at the summit? Um, all range of disabilities were invited. It was identified as very important by the co-design committee that, um, well, they acknowledge that a lot of the time when we talk about disability, we tend to talk about it in silos and say, you know, this is a psychosocial disability group, this is a group of intellectual disability. It was really important to the co-design committee to bring people with all sorts of different disability experiences together to share their uh, common understanding. So when you provide quotes and, and the data that arose out of the summit, you're really giving a representation of a broad cross-section of disabilities, aren't you? Absolutely, yes. And you mentioned that the summit was delivered online. Was mm -hmm. it always the intention that the summit be delivered online or was that as a result of COVID-19? That was very much a result of COVID-19. I think the co-design committee's original idea was to do a one-day in-person summit in Canberra and to bring people together. But actually COVID-19 presented a unique opportunity to actually allow more people to attend and make it in many ways more accessible. That's great. We'll touch on some of the um, aspects of learnings from COVID-19 a little bit later in your evidence. Um, there was a decision, wasn't there, in designing the summit to make four out of the five days um, youth-only days. Can mm -hmm. you explain that to me? Yes, so the co-design committee uh, really thought it was a priority to have a youth autonomous space, meaning that young people could come together, share their ideas, relate, connect with their peers from all across the country in a way that was safe and supported uh, in a way that they did not feel restricted in what they could say. And it was very deliberate that the day 
where older adults and workers could come along, that young people actually had the opportunity to talk directly to those people and kind of say, this is what we want. So it was very structured in the sense that it was still a youth driven space, even when older adults were welcome to the space. And the four youth only topics, they were education, employment, mental health and wellbeing, and the NDIS and housing, weren't they? That's correct, yes. As I mentioned earlier, Jess, for the purpose of today, we will focus on the summit as it related to employment. Yeah. Now, Jess, I'd just like to explore some of the use of data and the key themes Mm -hmm. that arose out of the summit. I imagine that a five-day summit, including 250 participants from around Australia, must have produced an incredible amount of data and quotes from summit participants. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We had, um, especially because we're using the online forums, we had um, the raw recordings of Zoom calls like we are having now. Um, We also had the chats, so what people were saying in the chats. And we also had things like PowerPoint slides that presenters were using that we could kind of draw upon too. So there was an immense amount of data And as such, when we were choosing to analyse the data, we really needed to consider what would be the most time effective way to do this because the the demand for the data was quite (laughs) strong. People wanted to know the information. Um, And for example, I wouldn't have been able to speak about today if we'd taken a different approach. So Mm -hmm. uh, we really felt the need to um, do what is called a code book thematic analysis Mm -hmm. which is essentially a fancy way of saying because the analysts, um, myself and two other people, were in all of the sessions observing, we were able to kind of say these are some of the things we observed that kept coming up. Let's identify these as themes and sub-themes and then go back and listen to everything and read everything and put it into encoder according to those that code book. Um, which is a much more efficient uh, way of getting the data. Right. And um, I imagine that that was a considerable body of work. Mm -hmm. At the conclusion of that, there were five key themes identified, weren't there? Yes. So those five key themes were identity, uh, enablers, barriers, solutions, and social movement. Okay, and what we're going to do now, Jess, is work through some, or in fact, work through all of those themes and um, obtain an understanding of what some of the summit participants identified under each of those. Mm -hmm. In terms of identity, um, one of the sessions of the summit posed the specific question to participants of what does getting or having a job mean to you? remembering that summit participants were all young people aged between 15 and 30 with disability. Yes. Can you share with the Commission, Jess, the types of responses and perhaps give some examples of responses that were given um, to that question? Absolutely. So overarching young people when discussing what employment meant to them said that it brought them independence, it brought them new skills, it gave them opportunities to meet new people, and it also gave them a sense of living a normal life and transitioning into adulthood. In regards to independence, young people discussed how earning money supports them to have the security and freedom to make life choices that are personally meaningful to them, which might be things like moving out or going on a trip. For example, one young person said, I found that a lot of people generally in my life think of a job as something they have to do to get money and that it's not realistic to enjoy a job. But I guess I've had a different experience as someone with an invisible illness where having a job gives you independence. If you can hold down a job, you can live outside of situations where you are not safe or or comfortable. You don't have to rely on an unreliable government system. Another young person said... Uh, It gives me the independence to start my life. That's huge. That's freedom. So young people really who attended the summit really felt that having a job gave them freedom to live the kind of life, like a good life, I guess you could say, that they um, was personally meaningful to them. An element of this was being able to develop skills and meet new people that can shape their identity and who they want to become and to add to develop their interests and passions. One young person said, 
Working in teams of different skills has been a great way to feel like my vision, both my low vision and my creative vision are being represented and fulfilled in like a really empowering and creative way. So in that sense, young people really could find work a way of channeling their energies and channeling their passions and also discovering passions they may not have otherwise thought of. And another element uh, that was really important was a job being part of a normal life and something that's sort of a transition that we should all be able to go through to become an adult. One young person said, jobs are a part of normal life. As a person, disabled or not disabled, I just think of a job as one of those things everyone does and it's something they can do with their passions. So once again, passion keeps coming up and it will keep coming up throughout everything I discussed today. So um, Jess, just drawing on some of those uh, quotes that you've just provided us with, it sounds like the concept of having a job was an overwhelmingly positive concept for participants. Is that a fair yeah. statement? Absolutely, yes. And were there any participants that, that um, identified that they didn't want to have a job? There was the occasional person who'd said they had negative experiences and it just sort of soured them towards having a job. Um, but overall, there was definitely a theme that young people felt they were capable and wanted to engage in the workforce and they really just needed someone to give them a go. It's that concept of opportunity that we'll keep coming back to yeah. um, throughout the Royal Commission. And I, I think from what you're saying, uh, young people with disability sound at the summit like they might have recognised the opportunities that might be provided to them by having a job. Would you agree Absolutely. with that? Absolutely. I think for young people, having a job was very much thought as a way of being able to initiate change both within their personal lives but also within um, representation and uh, and I might be getting ahead of myself here but <laughs> we'll talk about it a bit more later but um, in terms of creating opportunities for themselves, their communities and also society at large to enact change. That's interesting that you should say that Jess because that's something that's been identified in the evidence already the concept that unless we start to employ people with disabilities, we're never going to necessarily change societal expectations about employing mm -hmm. people with disabilities. Yes, so absolutely. That, that concept of opportunity. Um, Jess, two of the other key themes that were identified, um, which you've already touched upon, were enablers and barriers, weren't they? Yes. Uh, would I be able to add one last thing about identity before we move on? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, just one really strong element that stood out about identity for young people um, was having their full identity embraced in the workforce. So if young people, for example, identified as being Indigenous or a person of colour or being from a particular cultural group or being part of the LGBTQI community, this was something that they wanted to be celebrated and promoted um, within the workforce, but often it was not. Um, and often people run into barriers of it being something that um, would cause them to not experience um, positive experiences in employment. Um, but one young person did say in terms of positive experience, I found that working with a disability employment agency has been really life-changing for me. I managed to find a really good one just at a fair here in Victoria. They support people with disability who are also LGBTQI+. So it's good having people that understand all parts of you and are able to support you in all those different aspects. So you can see from that quote um, that young people with disability who attended the summit really wanted to be able to bring their full selves to work and to workplace situations like job interviews or um, job agencies in that case, um, where they can really be celebrated and be um, who they are. But unfortunately, this wasn't always the case. So one young person said, we note the situation for women of disability is often quite different to that with men with disability because we're not only coming against the systems of ableism, we're coming against the systems of misogyny and gendered violence as well. So once again, young people felt a great deal of pride in their identity as living with disability, but often did not have this kind of reciprocated or celebrated in the workforce. And it often acted as a barrier, unfortunately. So the real need for a, a person-centered approach to employment for people with disabilities. Absolutely. And I think recognising the unique experiences that can be drawn from 
being part of an intersectional community, living with disability, young people often thought this actually made them better employees and gave mm. them skills that their peers, may, their non-disabled peers may not have had. For example, one young person said, I do have a belief that my career and employment journey are deeply enriched by my journey of disability and that I'm succeeding because of my disability and not in spite of it. And that some of the things that I bring to the work I do to my employers, all the value that I get out of me is intrinsically linked with my disability. It's not me putting my disability to the side that helps me thrive and be great. It's the innate strengths that I get from my disability that brings some of my most important qualities. So once again, young people really wanted to bring them full selves to work and often to use their identity through work in things such as advocacy to really improve situations for their community. I do remember we had a panel that was called What is Advocacy and How Are You Already Doing It? And the young people who were on that panel were kind of inundated with questions about how did you become an advocate? What can I do to become an advocate? What did you study? What are the pathways? So young people with disability who attended the summit were really keen to, you know, like I said, live their full identity at work and be able to, you know, enhance things for their community through their work. And we'll touch on that a little bit later on, Jess, the concept of the, the young person with disability being a core part of the solution. Um, so thank you for identifying that now. Coming back to enablers and barriers, these were two of the other key themes that were identified. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, they were interconnected, weren't they? In, Absolutely. And by, by that, I mean that something can be a, a, an enabler if it is mm -hmm. provided or if it is done well. But equally, the same thing could be a barrier if it is not provided or not done well. Yes, and this is quite deliberate in the way we analyse the data was to show that how um, something can be, you almost if you flick the switch and say, you do this well, it works. You do it poorly, it doesn't work. Um, so I guess a key example I think we're trying to draw upon is the example of listening. Mm -hmm. For example, um, young people with disability often express that they did not feel listened to in the workplace um, and that they often found themselves um, having their employers make assumptions about them or to kind of say that you as a young person, for example, one quote said, as a young person myself, I've been told, no, you can't speak or no, you're not old enough. Um, so it's one of those situations where young people were often not listened to in the workplace and there were negative assumptions made about their disability that I'll go into a little bit further in a moment. But... Young people said how being listened to in the workplace on the, just the flip side was a really enabling factor in the sense of having someone um, like a peer worker or a mentor who listened to them was really valuable. Um, one young person said, being able to talk to a peer worker who's around the same age is really important. It can be quite intimidating speaking about some sensitive topics or an issue that's really important to somebody who's maybe never had those experiences before or maybe a lot older than them. They might not understand the language, and I think it's important to have that understanding of how to communicate effectively with other people like you. And it's also helpful to have similar experiences or background. So it might be, I've had the same problem before, and I know how I was able to overcome it. I do remember one young person who attended the summit spoke about um, even being able to, commu the communication style of having other young people in the workforce mm -hmm. or, or in, as peer workers, because often being in the, I know personally I've experienced it being the only young person in a, with a workforce, especially the only young person with a disability, how difficult that can be. And people talked about even having other young people around that they can communicate with memes and, you know, um, like acronyms that are common amongst young people and how having access to that was really valuable in terms of peer support. Um, was the con in terms of, and this might be a bit of an extension on peer support, but was the concept of... Um, having a person with a disability on, for example, a recruitment panel um, when potentially interviewing a person with disability, was that mentioned at all in the context of the summit? Absolutely. It was spoken about in the summit how people felt that having a person with disability on a recruitment panel actually levelled the playing field in many ways and addressed that power dynamic that can often exist with young people with disability and non-disabled older people. Um, they talked about how... Um, it also allowed them to kind of show off their skills. Once again, those skills that come from having a disability 
in the sense of here's me engaging with my peers and here's me engaging in a one-to-one level where you can see me sort of fries and it gave people that chance young people with disability that chance to I guess show off what makes them so unique and such a great asset. Jess, um, the concept of proactive supports was also raised again as both an enabler if it is mm-hmm. provided or done well and a barrier if it is not um, done well. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the concept of proactive supports? Absolutely. So as I just touched on, there is a power imbalance between young people with disability and their employers who's hiring them. There's always an element of a power differential. And this means that for young people with disability, not only can it be awkward bringing up things like access needs, it can be terrifying and it can be um, a source of great anxiety because you're inherently risking, <laughs> um, you know, many people feel they're risking their job or feel they're risking um, being judged. Their credibility. Their credibility, exactly. And I think um, the phrase I would use is that young people want um, employers to reach in. So not just reach out, but to reach into mm-hmm. the young person and kind of foster a culture of acceptance around diversity by saying things like, you know, oh, young people said, it's so much easier to have a conversation with your boss when they come to you first. Mm. So it, it opens up that dialogue. And one young person said, employers that are not just patient, but wanting to make sure that you have what you need so that you can do your job in a healthy way, as opposed to you having to fight for it every step of the way. It's mm. them reaching their hand out first, I guess, and saying, what do you need for, for, for you to make this work, as opposed to being scared of what might happen if you speak up. So the concept of not always leaving it to the person with the disability to request and, and um, ask for the modifications or adaptations that they might need. Absolutely. And it was discussed a lot in terms of accessibility, um, really being proactive in terms of making it clear what's already in place and saying, you know, we might have better lighting or we have you know different things around sound or different our we have these sorts of bathrooms, those sorts of things, making it clear to the person what you already have so that they're not also being put in a position to make themselves vulnerable to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. Um, That definitely came up not just on the employment day but all throughout the summit as well. A specific barrier that was identified by summit participants was negative assumptions in relation to the young person with a disability and their ability to undertake employment, wasn't it? Absolutely. Um, these assumptions were, went two ways in the sense that um, for, what, uh, for one, people might have assumptions about young people and they have assumptions about young people with disability. So, uh, so it's oh, you get people with disability. So if you're a young person with disability, you're almost in this double jeopardy of being mutually young and mutually disabled. And it creates a, a dynamic um, which can be quite challenging in which People might underestimate you and how much work you're willing to do, but they also might overestimate you. So um, assume that you, your capacity is stronger than it is without asking, once again, without being proactive. So um, one young person said in terms of underestimation, um, it is portrayed as odd that people with disabilities have a career. Another young person said they didn't want to get to know me or my interests or skills. So once again, that was an assumption that if you walk in, especially as someone with a visible disability, um, they might kind of switch off already and go, that's not quite right for us. Um, Other young people talked about being, I use the term overestimated and I don't mean that disrespectfully. I'm just using that for the sake of connecting the two. But what I'm essentially saying is when employers don't take access into consideration, and some participants talked about where employers would not consider or listen to young person's needs around their disability, <laughs> often making the assumption that they would be fine. So one young person said, my experience was somewhat opposite, trying to get people to accept my limitations and that it was in fact okay that I had them. Other young people talked about um, sometimes feeling like they were not disabled enough to warrant support in the workplace or that In other contexts, they may be deemed too disabled to be worth the hassle. So one young person said, people want to only think in high functioning or low functioning instead of everyone having unique barriers. So once again, that relates back to that proactivity of employers 
making that assumption that you're either high functioning or low functioning, there's nothing in the middle um, and not having that conversation with the young person and starting that dialogue. It's really interesting, Jess, because a lot of what you say is entirely on point with some of the evidence that the Commission has already heard um, and will hear from other witnesses throughout the course of this hearing. And um, particularly the concept of having to put in so much effort to reach the same point in the day as other people. Was that something that some participants touched upon as well? I think so. I, I think it was absolutely, there was a sense of frustration um, that um, it often came up throughout the summit overall, that phrase of the world was not designed for us and often how people use that as a throwaway statement of, well, the world wasn't designed for us, so yada, yada, yada. But um, actually how wrong that is <laughs> and how we can't just accept that anymore. We need to say, well, the world wasn't designed for us, let's design a new world. Um, that was definitely something that came up as a recurring um, idea. Jess, one of the other um, things that will be touched upon in the course of the hearing with um, some of our witnesses is the mistreatment that they may have um, suffered as a result of having to undertake significant amounts of volunteer work mm -hmm. or other unpaid work. Is that something that was um, identified in the course of the summit? Yes, that, would, that did come up throughout the summit. Um, one example I can give you is of a young person who shared their experience of doing free work experience um, at the promise of their work eventually into, eventuating into a job. The employer was, quote, the person referring to the employer said, he said earlier in the year he was going to hire me. Then he went, when I went back and asked for the job, he said, nah, we don't have any work, but didn't say why. Um, another young person talked about um, securing some employment through a disability employment service provider and explained how Naturally, like I've said, young people are eager to get into the workforce. They really are. So this young person kind of rushed into the opportunity, um, but unfortunately the job was not the opportunity they had hoped for and they experienced unpaid overtime, underpaid wages and insufficient breaks. And they felt that the on, they had an onset of health challenges that was directly triggered mm. by this experience in the work environment. And like I touched on earlier, this was the person I was referring to about having negative attitudes towards employment this young person reflecting on this experience and how they felt the disability employment service had not supported them effectively and let them go into a dangerous and risky situation. They said, for me, there is not a good thing about employment because I was not supported when I was working. And so the barriers were, as I was not supported well, treated me not fairly, discriminated against as well. So unfortunately, I think young people, once, like I said, that young person really had an eagerness to work, but negative experiences can really um, deter them. And that, uh, just to pick up on that point, it's the power and the impact of potentially only one negative experience, mm -hmm. but that can have a flow-on effect then to that, that young person with disabilities perception and experiences of employment. Absolutely. And I think I do have another quite strong example of discrimination um, where a young person talked about attending a job interview where the job interview was not accessible for them. So they said, one of the things is access. Big problem for me with physical disability and using a wheelchair. I applied for a role and got to the interview stage where there was a training session for about 20 people. When I got there, the room wasn't accessible. I got in touch with the people and they said, oh, well, we'll follow up with you afterwards. But then they never followed up. Mm. Um, so you can see there how that could really <laughs> have a detrimental effect on how young people, I think as young people, um, you know, we're constantly changing and forming new opinions of the world. We're going for a massive flux in our identity and to have something like that happen when you're young, I mean, that can have really damning effects on how you view. Um, and I think there's a undertone that people expect people with disability to be resilient. That's a really, mm. um, <laughs> it's quite a frustrating undertone that, that exists. And not to say that we're not resilient, but we shouldn't have to be, you know what I mean? And um I One of our other witnesses yesterday, Jess, um, described it as you have to be extraordinary to be ordinary. Yeah. Um, that's a little bit like that concept. Yeah, it shouldn't, um, it shouldn't be an issue to go to a job interview. It shouldn't. In considering the solutions to some of the problems that have been identified, summit participants um, identified themselves as a core part of the solution and they um, reported what they um, wanted to do 
in that they wanted to exist loudly. Mm-hmm. I really like the sound of that, um, <laughs> but I don't necessarily know what it means. Can you explain it to me? I'll tell you the story of where the phrase exist loudly came from. Exist loudly was a phrase. Um, it's one of my personal mottos that I was kind of using to describe the latent themes that were coming up in the data about what people, the undertones the young people were discussing. Um, and I got this phrase, and I will shout this person out, from a T-shirt I own designed by a queer, disabled um, and young disabled activist um, and artist, Ruby Allegra. So anyone who's listening, go check out Ruby Allegra and buy their shirts. <laughs> <laughs> but they exist loudly on a shirt. Um, so that's a, it's a phrase that I've adopted from that shirt that I kind of use about my own life. And I think it was a theme that kind of came through latently um, in the summit in the sense that young people were talking about how they really want to be part of the solutions. They want to take up space. And like I said, they're so eager to work, but they need support to do that. And they really want to be handed the microphone and to represent for their community. They're so proud of their community and they really just want to represent and take up space and to make change. And they really think they can make a change if provided the support to do so. So for example, one young person said, Lots of systems were designed in a way that don't reflect young people and young people really want to shape these systems. So I think it's a situation where young people um, really want to be out there and making the change and don't want to be consulted. They want to lead it. (laughs) Um, And as I said, young people view themselves as capable and hungry to contribute and they want to do meaningful work, but it's a struggle because it was identified uh, at the summit that these kind of ideas of productivity and it's driven by capitalist notions um, that dominate our society is that you have to be productive to be worth something. And the young people with disability who attended the summit really felt that they were worth something regardless of how productive they were and that they could be um, really great contributors to important work um, if they were given the opportunity to be measured beyond their productivity but measured as their worth as a person and their skills. Um, One young person said, I think accessibility and employment for me is getting able to do that meaningful work, but also having time so I can fit in rest and physical medical appointments Mm. and fit in caring responsibilities and my community responsibilities as well. Obviously involves a whole array of things as well. It means having a comfortable seat and that kind of equipment that allows me to rest. But ultimately, meaningful work for young people with disabilities, I think, really requires us tac- involving requires involving us tackling this idea of our value being tied to our productivity and knowing that we're capable of engaging in work that supports our well-being and yeah ourselves Jess, um, as i suspected um when you and i were preparing for this evidence i suspected that we could probably talk about these issues for probably around three to four hours. (laughs) Unfortunately, we don't have that amount of time today and we are almost um, out of time. I did want to just uh, touch on um, the role of education that was Mm -hmm. identified by uh, young people with disability attending the summit. And it was the case, wasn't it, that while some of the participants identified the need to educate employers, others identified the need to actually uh, institute a, a program and a process yeah. of, of education at a school level. That's Absolutely. Correct, so young people talked about um, how starting from the ground up and doing things like improving representation of, of people with disability in society, so having people with disability existing loudly in education, coming into schools, doing talks, mm-hmm. um, having people with disability being in all forms of life just existing loudly and how that can actually educate people as well as formal education. But it was really regarded as, yeah, if you're, employ- if you're educating an employer, that's almost too late. It really needs to be intervened in the education system from a young age. And not to say that we shouldn't try and I don't know, teach an old dog tr- new tricks, I guess, but it really needs to start from the ground up to address those kind of power dynamics the young people experience. Other suggestions also included doing, engaging in things like co-design and steering groups, providing young people meaningful opportunities to, for one, engage in that sort of education, to um, educate people about, for for example, one young person said, we need career paths that put us in positions of power and authority to enact change, 
to create a more accessible society. So having young people really doing things like co-design and then building their way up into leadership positions so that they can enact and design those sorts of education structures that you would put in place in schooling systems that would eventually lead to this kind of ripple effect of representation and changing attitudes that would ultimately create a more inclusive and accessible society in general, but also in regards to employment. That's fantastic, Jess. Um, thank you so much for the evidence that you've given today. As I said, there are so many other um, topics that we could have touched upon in the context of employment and the commissioners do have the benefit of your um, very detailed statement. Um, I would like to personally thank you for your statement and for appearing today um, to give the evidence and in the preparation that you've so clearly done um, to actually present your evidence today. I'm very grateful for that. Thank I you. would like to pass over to the commissioners now to ask whether or not they might have any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I'll first ask uh, Commissioner Galbally, who is in Melbourne, uh, whether she would like to ask you any questions. Thank you very much for your statement. That I found very, very valuable. Um, in paragraph 94, you refer to young people as systemic and individual advocates, I presume for all areas, but also employment. Mm -hmm. I just wondered whether you could you'd care to elaborate and expand on that. So let me get paragraph 94 in front of me quickly. Um, yes, so young people really regarded themselves as lived experience experts and wanted to be honoured in that process of providing their unique insights and input to contribute to a kind of movement or a social movement to increase employment opportunities for young people with disability. So it's really seen as um, paying young people, <laughs> definitely paying young people was highlighted as an important factor to do things like co-design, to do things like systemic and individual advocacy and to let them be the experts in their own lived experience so that they can make a change. And it was very much regarded is that classic phrase of nothing about us without us, that um, if you need a change from um, young people, you know, about young people's issues, you need to consult, you need to involve young people and let them lead the way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Atkinson, who is in Brisbane, would you, do you, you. have any? Thank you. I just wanted to thank you, Jess, for living out loud with us and giving <laughs> us uh, your views, which are much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan. Um, no, I don't have any questions, Mr. Chief. But thank you for your presentation this morning. And I don't think I'll forget living loudly for some time. <laughs> uh, Jess, I, I had a question about the composition of the group at the 250. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was age, the people were aged from 15 to 30. <clears throat> How many of those did you do you know uh, were actually in employment at the time of uh, the uh, uh, conversation? Unfortunately, I'm not sure if we collected that data, but I can uh, inquire to find out and perhaps provide that to you after the fact, if that's okay? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. And some of the uh, participants, I assume, were still at school. Yes, many of them were still in school. Um, some of the young people, people who were 15 there were so cool. I was, I was not this cool when I was 15. <laughs> they were so passionate and so impressive. Um, but there was also, yeah, many young people who were involved in employment um, who were perhaps in their early 20s who um, were really passionate about their work. And, um, yeah, we couldn't include those quotes because it would have identified them but really spoke about how much they loved their work. Thank you very much. And uh, I endorse the comments that have been made by the other commissioners for the value of your evidence and the uh, statements that you have provided and also the work that obviously went into uh, the summit. And Thank you. <coughs> it's uh, obviously been a, an extremely useful undertaking that uh, should have some long-term benefits. So we're very grateful for that to have been done and for you giving your evidence today. So thank you thank very you. much. Do we move now to Ms Zerma in Brisbane? That's correct, Chair. The next witness is Mr Oliver Collins. He's appearing in person here in Brisbane, and Mr Collins will just make his way now into the Commission room. Thank you. We'll just wait for Mr Collins to come on screen for those of us uh, who have the misfortune not to be in Brisbane. <laughs>
Mr. Collins, thank you very much for uh, coming to the Commission in Brisbane today to give your <clears throat> evidence. Could I ask you at the outset, please, if you would be good enough to follow the instructions of Commissioner Atkinson's associate, who is in the Brisbane hearing room with you, and she will administer the affirmation. Thank you. Thank you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Collins. Uh, Ms. Zerma, who's in the room with you in Brisbane, will uh, now ask you some questions. And just uh, so you uh, know where the commissioners are located, Commissioner Galbally is in Melbourne. Commissioner Ryan is in Sydney with me in the Sydney hearing room. So I'll now ask Ms. Zerma to ask you some questions. Mr. Collins, can you tell the Commission your full name? Oliver Darrell Collins. It's correct, isn't it, that you've provided a statement to the Royal Commission? Yes, dated 18th of November. Thank you. Have you had a chance to read that recently? Yes. Don't require any changes or amendments to be made to it? No, thank you. True and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes. Excellent. Um, Commissioners, you'll find Mr. Collins' statement in Tender Bundle Part A at Tab B, and I'd ask to tender this statement into evidence and that it be marked as Exhibit 9.14, please. <coughs> yes, Mr. Collins' statement will be Exhibit 9.14. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Mr. Collins, you're a solicitor in the Dispute Resolution, Resolution Group at King and Wood Mallisons here in Brisbane? That's correct. And you're actually in the same building um, as we're in today. Yes. Um, and it's commonly referred to Mallison's. Are you happy for me to call it as Mallison's today? Yes. Excellent. And you've been at Mallison's since about January 2017? Yes, in a full-time capacity. Excellent. You had done some work experience before that, that's right? Yes. I want to come back to your work experience a little bit later on as we're going on through your evidence. Mm -hmm. um, since being at Mallison's, uh, you've always worked in litigation, that's right? Yes. Must be a strange experience being on the other end of me asking you questions then today. <laughs> yes, it's been an interesting experience, but probably good for a lawyer to have that. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to come back to your work at Mallison's a little bit later on in your evidence. Um, but it's correct, isn't it, that working in litigation, you're working the same hours as your colleagues at the moment? Yep. And you're also undertaking the same billable hours as your colleagues. Mm -hmm. And for those people who are following on who aren't lawyers, we all refer to billable hours, but it's really a productivity goal in some respects of a daily goal to achieve. Is that right? Yes, yes. And so um, different solicitors will have different goals to achieve, but you're on the same as your other colleagues that you're working with. Yes, and um, some days if there's a bit more work, you might do, do more hours, and then some days there won't be as much work. Uh -huh. And you really have to you kind of judge based on the urgency of the task. Sure. And Ms. I think Ms. You... Ms. Irma, can I just interrupt? to ask if you don't mind just slowing down a little. Mr. Collins, is, Mr. Collins is exemplary in that respect. <laughs> uh, you're, you're racing ahead and so far you're three furlongs ahead. So, uh, <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Maybe, um, I maybe will take come back to the pack. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring yeah. myself back into the pack. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, Mr. Collins, you talked about doing different lengths of days depending on the work capacity. Um, you say in your statement that you had your first Supreme Court trial in 2018, is that right? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you were uh, assisting with some proceedings being heard in Sydney? Yes, that's correct. Can you tell us what your role was, I guess, in relation to the trial, but what sort of work requirements were necessary at that time for you? Uh, so, um, in the, I didn't go down to Sydney, so for the Sydney proceedings, um, you know, it was gathering documents that council had requested or preparing letters or reviewing discovery that the other the other parties were giving us. Um, but um, there were four there were four parties in that matter. So sometimes you can imagine you're getting lots of documents from different different parties. You know, there was 
quite a large volume of work to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of the proceedings in Queensland, you know, there was many conferences with the witness to help prepare uh, the client, to help him prepare. Mm -hmm. uh, again, there was a lot of reviewing documents or responding to questions or letters from the other parties in that proceeding, um, attending court every day. The, the trial was um, about 12 days, I think, mm -hmm. at the end of the year. Um, but so, and just managing those two together, sometimes facilitated, but sometimes necessitated having a late night here or there. But, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't, it wasn't just me. I was there with the other people working mm -hmm. and I was happy to, you know, be part of the team. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it wasn't, there was no unusual expectation placed on me. It was just, you know, that was what sometimes happens as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. It does. It does. Um, Mr. Collins, what I'd like to do is just if you can tell us a little bit about your disability. And you've said in your statement that at about the age of 18 months, you were diagnosed with a very rare neuromuscular condition. Can you just tell the commissioners a little bit about your condition? Yes. So it's called FOP or fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva. Bit of a mouthful. <laughs> um, so what it does is it causes my muscles and tendons and ligaments to turn to bone and for bone to grow on top of existing bone and across joints and through joints. So as a, to put it basically, it encases the body in a second skeleton, which results in very limited movement. And um, so I currently I am um, able to walk very slowly and a little bit, but I mostly use a wheelchair, mm -hmm. um, a manual or an electric wheelchair. And I also have a walking stick for balance because mm -hmm. my hips have frozen in a way that I am very off balance. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, yeah. and it's quite a rare condition, you said, in the sense that there's not very many people. And I think you say in your statement as to the numbers. So, yes, there's um, only about 19 patients in Australia mm -hmm. and there's less than 1,000 known cases worldwide. Mm -hmm. And in regards to where you're at now, as I understand, it's been progressive. Is that right? Yes. So um, as m most patients will find there's a slower progression earlier on, unless they're, so, so the condition can be exacerbated by trauma, and that might be something like having a biopsy, or that could be something like falling over, as mm -hmm. happens to children. Mm -hmm. So not but normally, and as was the case with me, it progressed quite slowly throughout my early childhood years. Mm -hmm. And then um, around puberty, it oftentimes will start to, you'll start to see a more noticeable progression. Mm -hmm. So I uh, first started with my shoulder, my shoulders and my back started to get affected. But again, it progressed quite slowly for me. Um, and then it really heated up um, in the last kind of uh, three, four years. Mm -hmm. Mr. Collins, if I take you back to growing up, and I guess uh, in those teenage years, um, you had some more capacity than you currently have now. Is that right? Uh, yes, a lot more physical capacity. A lot more physical capacity. And you say in your statement that um, you weren't treated any differently at home in regards to your siblings. Yes. Um, so can you just explain that in regards to expectations with study and all of those sorts of things? Uh, yes. So um, my both my parents are professionals. And so um, academic success at school was made quite a high priority. So um, that, you know, there was an expectation, given like me and my siblings demonstrated that we did have the capacity if we applied ourselves. So um, there was always a, an expectation that you would put in enough, that you would put in work to do well at school because the um, goal in our family was always to... Um, have a fulfilling career, so to be able to get into whatever course we chose at mm -hmm. university. Um, and so, um, yeah, that, you know, it was the same for me as well as my siblings. Mm -hmm. And that application of having to do well at school and really applying yourself, that led you to studying law? Uh, partially, yes. There was also some assistance from a careers advisor. Mm -hmm. And when you're working through that, as I think you said, the, your siblings have had, went through the same process or your brother went through the same process yeah, in I regards think, to choosing a career. I think a lot of, but having chatted with friends at the time, a lot of, I think it's quite normal for people to not be entirely sure of what they might want to do, especially mm -hmm. when you think, oh, this is what I'm going to be doing for the next 30, 40 years. 
there's a lot of pressure on a 16, 17 year old to make that choice. Mm-hmm. So, and and making that choice, did you have to take into account your disability and um, what the future might look for might look like for you? Yes. And yeah. and you you chose that you thought that law with that guidance counsellor would be an appropriate career for you to pursue. Yes, I mean, knowing how much computer work was involved, I thought it would be an ideal career. All right. Um, and it sounds like with all the documents and things you've just talked about, that that's, that's actually turned out to be true in regards to computer and, uh, and accessing all of those materials. Yes, yeah. Um, I'd like to take you back in time if I can. Um, you talk in your statement about when you're at university versus school and you talk about the, the size of the organisation and that was a bit daunting for you. But you also say that there was a level of confidence that, that you perhaps didn't have uh, in terms of your disability and how that perhaps affected you at university. Can you just explain a little bit about that? Um, at, at school, I was involved in my um, uh, IPC meetings, but I did also have my mum my was there. My mum played a big role in assisting to speak up when I might have wanted to be a bit quieter. But at university, when, you know, you're kind of entering the real world, uh, you know, it was left up to me. And so at those times when mum might have spoken up for me at school and I didn't, at university there was no one, like I was left to my own devices. And so if I didn't take charge and speak up, yeah, um, you know, that was... And did you, it didn't happen. Did you find that hard in regards to confidence and perhaps because of your age and the change from school to going to university? Yeah, it was very intimidating. Mm. And you have to excuse my naivety. You said IPC on meetings. What was that? Uh, that's in the individual, um, it's an individual plan for students with physical impairments. And that was at school yes. that you had that? Yeah. Right. Um, you had the opportunity to complete some paid uh, and volunteer work experience before you commenced at Mallison's. That's right. If we look back, um, going from 2012, uh, among other work experience opportunities, you worked as a research clerk and you worked in a small litigation firm. That's right. Mm-hmm. And just in regards to getting those jobs, is it the case, as I understand it, that it was through informal contacts um, that we're able to do some introductions? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, my um, father had worked with the two two partners at the, both the law firms separately. Mm-hmm. And then so he got me a copy and then I turned that into a work experience op- op- opportunity. Right. So you were introduced to the contact, but then you pursued the opportunity and that was successful in a, obtaining those opportunities. Yes. Right. You were, um, you, you say that you were content to be treated the same as your colleagues. And even if you were adjust, offered adjustments you would not have liked to have accepted them at the time. Can you just explain a little bit about why that is? I feel like there's a, a greater amount of pressure on people with disabilities because the attitude still is that we're a burden. And so even if we might to an out, like even if we might feel like we're doing the same amount of work, we have to go above and beyond to prove to everyone that we belong to be there because we, uh, there is an added, um, I mean, there, it's different to have to having an able-bodied person when you need special arrangements mm-hmm. put in place. So, um, yeah, there was a, and a, a, some of it might also be internal pressure as well, I think. Mm-hmm. We put a greater burden on ourselves to make us feel like we're making the same contribution. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think there's still a bit of work that, to change that perspective, both internally and from a general social perspective, Mm -hmm. um, so that people with disabilities can, like, they don't have to deal with that added pressure. They can just focus on doing the job at hand and doing the best that they can and proving all their positive attributes. Mm -hmm. And just in in going back to to, um, going into law, Um, We hear that for a graduate position that it's very competitive. Did you feel that that was an extra burden on you in regards to undertaking that work experience? Yes, yeah. And so I think what you've said there is that um, because of the competitiveness of it, you didn't want to be a burden. You you didn't want to stand out from those other colleagues that you're working with. Is that right? Yes, but as a result, I may have put my body through more pressure and more pain than I 
otherwise should have been able to. Mm -hmm. And so the more pressure and the more pain, is it that you're putting those things aside to try and fit in um, to be able to uh, achieve the next step in your career? So you want to succeed at your work experience to look at other opportunities? To the extent you can put it aside. There's always a little, like when you're not fully comfortable physically, there's always a little bit at the back of your mind that's kind of stopping you from giving 110%. Mm -hmm. And do you think, um, again, that perhaps age and confidence came into that a little bit in regards to those work experience? Oh, yes, yes, definitely. So perhaps the Mr. Collins today might be, might be slightly different as to how you would approach that today. Yes. All right. Um, you say that, uh, and you talked about that just very briefly, about the mental anguish that goes on um, and perhaps some inner chatter. Mm -hmm. um, can you just explain to us what process that you go through in, in that regard when you're in a work environment and you're trying to be equal um, with your colleagues, not wanting to be a burden? Do you have to... Um, you, you, you have to kind of, um, to the extent you can, you kind of push it aside, you know, you, you with a disability, you can sometimes get quite good at smiling, even though you're, you're feeling a bit of pain or you're feeling, you know, a bit uncomfortable. So you just, um, you, you kind of get like a, a suit of armour on and you don't really let people in to see the full picture because, mm -hmm. you know, you don't want, I, I think a lot of times it, my personal experience is you don't want to always bring people fully on board with the disability experience. Mm. So you, it kind of stops you having authentic connections with your colleagues because mm -hmm. you're never really 100% sure. there. Mm -hmm. Or you're not letting them 100% in. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing is that there's the physical aspects of perhaps working through pain um, and then there's obviously this mental anguish. We had a witness yesterday who talked about um, that having the taxing nature of disability um, and the stress that goes with that, but also she talked about having to constantly problem solve about, for example, getting to a meeting or going to a particular event or something like that. Is that something you have to think about uh, in your position as to how I'm going to manage uh, this particular invite I've got in relation to an event or something like that? Uh, yes, but I've, um, I myself have tried to turn those little challenges into a silver lining of sorts. So when you accomplish something that you told yourself you, you couldn't do or that you wouldn't do, that, you know, I kind of I'd like to celebrate those little wins. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm going to come to something about that shortly um, towards the end. Um, in regards to the undertaking that work experience, um, certainly for graduate lawyers, there's the opportunity of undertaking cl clerkships and that's a pathway into a graduate position. Is that right? Yes, that's the standard pathway. And it's the case, isn't it, that you weren't able to undertake clerkships because of some medical treatment you were having. Is that right? Yes, I, I was participating in a drug trial. This was the first proposed treatment for my condition. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I was diagnosed, my parents were told there would be no cure during my lifetime. So it was very exciting, my, very exciting opportunity. Unfortunately, it didn't work, but it was still an exciting opportunity to have that option. Um, but it meant that I had to move over to Philadelphia for six weeks. Mm -hmm. And as luck would have it, it fell right at the time that all the clerkship applications were due. And then at the times they were doing full of interviews and unfortunately the clerkship process, the application process is very traditional and fixed and not that not flexible enough to facilitate um, someone from overseas. Mm -hmm. And because you weren't able to go through that traditional path of applying for a clerkship, um, you had to look for other opportunities, is that right? Uh, yes, yes, I am. Um, I, in that last year, I looked for any and all opportunities I could. And you were applying for positions, um, but you also had the opportunity to undertake some work experience with a barrister, didn't you? Uh, yes, a family friend had asked me to come in and um, assist him as, in a research 
a voluntary research capacity um, in my second last semester of university. Mm -hmm. And then that led to a contact at Mallison's, is that right? Yeah, so the, it wasn't, uh, there was no formal arrangement or anything. He had just said um, he needed some assistance. So I went in and helped him, and, but he was very impressed with the quality of work I did, did for him. And so he sent um, my resume along with a letter to um, a partner at Mallison who he went to university with. And that partner then invited me to come in for some work experience. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about that work experience? I imagine it would have been a bit daunting, was it, to to uh, go in and to start doing that work experience and to see where it was going to lead? Uh, well, it was intimidating from the perspective of going from, you know, a small litigation firm with maybe 14, 15 people to go to a firm like Mallison's. So, you know, entering the big leagues there. Um, but I think it was really beneficial for me because I was, I think I was there for three, two, two weeks or three weeks, but however long it was, it was enabled me to have a more practical interview or interview of sorts so that I could demonstrate, you know, taking aside a disability from a traditional job interview where you might have to make snap decisions about someone within five minutes. You know, that two weeks enabled me to kind of relax into the role more and demonstrate that, you know, despite having a disability, I could still do any of the require like any of the requirements of a future graduate lawyer mm -hmm. or future lawyer, um, and enabled me to really um, demonstrate my positive attributes and pot like skills that I could bring to the job. Mm -hmm. And you refer to, I guess, um, traditional. Uh, recruitment versus the recruitment you went through, um, and you say an extended interview of sorts. Um, do you think, and I think you've said that you would feel that that would be helpful for people to have that opportunity to go through a non-traditional recruitment? Is that right? Well, I think well, I think we generally need to move away from tradition because you know not just people with disability, but non-traditional models fit a lot of people, like would benefit a lot of people better. I think in being able to demonstrate what unique perspectives each person can bring to a job. Mm -hmm. So I think it would definitely be beneficial. Mm -hmm. And going through that process, what happened after you've done the work experience? So you were offered the position, is that right? Uh, so I wasn't like my bot, the partner I work for now had said he wanted to find me a position, mm -hmm. but it wasn't guaranteed. So then, um, but he pushed for me. And then um, within a couple of months, I was offered that permanent role. Mm -hmm. So I I wasn't a graduate, but I was like next to the graduates essentially. So right. I did my PLT with them. Mm -hmm. And then since I was admitted, I just moved to a full-time solicitor role in the litigation team. Excellent. And are you jo enjoying your role in the litigation team? Is it work but that you're very enjoying? Much so. Excellent. And what does it mean to be able to have that independence and to have the job in litigation and to um, be able to succeed through that graduate program? Uh, it's an amazing... Like, it's it's amazing because for people like me with a physical impairment, being physically dependent on people to do, you know, a lot of my basic tasks, like, you know, helping me make my meals and helping me get changed and stuff. So to be able to make that contribution just like, you know, anybody else, like it, it gives me an amazing sense of personal achievement and personal satisfaction mm -hmm. to be like just one part that can be, normal for want of a better word mm -hmm. um and in regards to your condition you have said that it has progressed in the last couple of years and there was a point where you reached um a, a time in april 2019 you you say in your statement that you woke up and you felt exhausted and you asked if you could work from home and you had some adjustments at, at around that time in regards to your working can you just explain a little bit about that uh, yes so prior to that my boss had said if there's anything they could do to let them know. Um, and there were already other people in my team. Uh, there was a mother who was um, working from home ad hoc. Mm -hmm. So the precedent was there, but I didn't want to do it because, you know, I'm a social person. I get a lot of emotional benefit being at work and networking with colleagues and connecting with people. But it got to the point because, you know, it... Um, you know, I try and walk around as much as I can now, but it is, it's physically exhausting mm -hmm. spending a day in the office. So it got to the point where I just 
had had this couldn't face <laughs> just had to have a day of rest mm -hmm. um and then after that you know it started to become a more regular kind of you know two days a week kind of thing it took a period of adjustment for me to you know get into the swing of working from home but you know now that I've been doing it for a little while it's actually it's become much more beneficial for me mm -hmm. from a productivity perspective and from a health perspective because I still alternate and have those days staying in touch with my colleagues and networking but mm -hmm. then I also have the physical opportunity to rest and you know moving my moving around my apartment which is much smaller mm -hmm. is much less physically demanding mm -hmm. so um I you know I have that those days at home to kind of physically you know try and maintain my position without putting too much physical stress on myself mm -hmm. and then COVID hit and then your colleagues were ha having that experience of working from home as well um did that affect the team at all in the sense of understanding the dynamics of working at home and what you're what you had been doing uh having chatted with colleagues at, during the past couple of months i i know that they had the same kind of adjustment period to working from home you know tech, when you're used to going to the office it is a bit of a mental adjustment to get used to working you know i work from my bed for example <laughs> but you know i think now having been doing it for a couple of months a lot of people are seeing the benefits not just for other people, but for themselves as well. Yes. You know, being able to have that day, for example, with their kids or just having a day at home when you don't feel like getting into your full-on work suit. <laughs> you know, I, I, I know a lot of people that I've had chats with are seeing a very, if, I don't want to call it a silver lining of COVID, but, you know, seeing the benefits of this kind of working arrangement. Sure. And, Mr Collins, you've come back into the office, haven't you, since COVID now? So you're back to... A similar routine or you're building up to that routine is that right uh, yeah so i started coming in one day a week and it would have been maybe july or august and then after a couple of after a month or so maybe built up to two days so eventually the goal is to get up to three again but you know i just said to my boss i'm not there yet i just it's still very physically taxing um, and i've got to build up my fitness level again um so my boss was totally understanding and said, you know, you do just, you know, keeps in the loop. Um, but, you know, whenever you can make it in three days, that would be great, but no pressure. Mm -hmm. And you said to build up again. So was there an endurance aspect of because uh, that assists you in some regards when you were getting into the office three days a week? So is, is that what you mean in that regard? Uh, it seems ironic for me to talk about my fitness level, but um, there, there is this, it, that it is, you know, it's a it's a long, it's a big effort walking around the office. You know, walking to the bathroom, for example, um, and so it does take a bit of time to kind of build up that level again to where I can do it without being absolutely shattered by the time I get back from the bathroom. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just taking my time. Yeah, no, that's great. I want to move to a different topic now, um, and it's something that I think you're quite passionate about, as I understand, and that is the Diverse Abilities Network of the Queensland Law Society. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It's a fairly new venture, I understand. Uh, it's very, yes, it's, it's very new and it's very exciting. So um, I saw a post on LinkedIn uh, in about December of last year um, and it was just, you know, calling out to, and it wasn't even from my connection, it was just one of my connections liked it, I think, mm -hmm. so it came up on my feed. And she was calling out for people with, um, any, any lawyers with disabilities to want to connect and just have a, you know, have a chat about diversity in the profession. And it was so exciting to see our, like our governing body putting out that call and, you know, obviously wanting to start the conversation. So I, I messaged her, I emailed her privately and said, you know, whatever, whatever this, whatever comes of this, like I am very keen to be involved in whatever capacity I can. And I mentioned it to my boss as well. He was, you know, very excited and, you know, very supportive of me being involved with that. And so it um, took a couple of months. And then in February, we had our first meeting. And then since then, it's grown. We've um, released a couple of articles and a couple of videos. And other, connect other people on LinkedIn have reached out. And so, you know, the network's now just, you know, going 
going really well. Excellent. And so you're you're a founding member of the network. What's what's the aim of the network? What was it when you came together to decide well, what we want to achieve through this network? Uh, I think generally the aim is to raise the profile of disability and more. From my perspective, I think we can do a lot just through our sharing our own personal stories of being, you know, lawyers with diverse abilities and a variety of different diverse abilities. Um, I think we can do a lot just sharing our story and encouraging other people, um, other people who might be thinking about law or other people who are studying law, mm-hmm. showing them that it can be done and that, you know, you can have a really fulfilling career. Mm-hmm. And also demonstrating to employers and there are, you know, there's in-house lawyers, there's like lawyers like me, there's, you know, there's a variety of different um, backgrounds in terms of their legal careers, encouraging all employers to look at, you know, look at us and um, kind of realise that people with disabilities can be very valuable and contributing members of your workforce Mm -hmm. and that they should definitely be considered for employment positions. Mm -hmm. And I think you said earlier in in your statement that you have a goal that that you hope one day that you don't, people don't walk into an interview or into a job opportunities, they don't have to ask in regards to adjustments and don't have to ask about the disability, no. but the employer asks them. So it's a rather than having to put it back on the person with disability. Is that right? Yes, it would be really lovely to see a world where, you know, it's people are people are just appreciated for the unique contribution they're making rather than not looked at as being burdensome because they might require some special arrangements in order to make that contribution. Mm-hmm. Excellent. There's a paragraph in your statement, and I don't need to take you to it. It's at the conclusion of your statement. And you say, um, in regards to talking about yourself, and I'll just read that if that's okay with you, Mr. Collins. It says, throughout my life, I have felt that there is a certain pressure that people with disability often grow up with, in that we are not supposed to aim for the same things. This can lead to a certain amount of self-sabotaging, sometimes for people with disability, as they may not develop the same ambition. In order for this to get better, people's attitudes towards disability need to start modifying so that people with disability won't always hear no, they will hear yes, or yes, let's just do it a bit differently. Um, And that's what you mean, I guess, in regards to that employment opportunities for people with disability to have that opportunity. Yes, I was lucky enough to be raised with parents who, um, from a very early age, instilled that in me and so if I whatever I can do to help instill that in future generations of disabled lawyers Mm -hmm. I'm very keen to do. Excellent. Mr Collins in addition to the Diverse Abilities Network um, which you're a co-founding member you've recently started a blog isn't that right? Yes that's correct. And it's called Ollie's Story? Yes. And what's the purpose of starting the blog? I for the longest time you know having had discussions with my friends who uh, a variety of able-bodied and disabled, you know, it really kept hitting me like just how similar we all are. I mean, you know, we're all different in some ways, sure, but we're all, we're all feeling the same things. We're all going through the same crises or the same, you know, pr- problems or the same journey. Um, so I really, and uh, people have always said the way I write is it kind of brings that out. And so, you know, and I love to write. So just in isolation, when isolation started, I thought, why not? So, you know, really the purpose is to help kind of normalise disability and bring it into the general discussion and go, you know, you know, hey, people with disability are just like you. And I think you say in your blog that it's a silver lining approach, which you mentioned earlier in your evidence, and that's what you're trying to portray in, in your blog, as I understand but also for people to learn from things you've been through that might help them. Yeah, sometimes it's easier with a with like with the disability experience to write it down rather than to describe it to someone with like talking to them. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes also if people can go back and read it again and again to kind of help them understand it, I think that also helps like bring it, you know, condense it down for people so for able-bodied people so they can really see the, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of people have told me, oh, I think like that too, or I thought that. So, you know, I think it, it really helps kind of 
bring the discussion back to a positive place. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And there's a number of posts there. We don't need to go to those posts, but there's some excellent uh, blogs there. But it must be very busy. You know, you're working, you've got your billable hours to meet and you're doing this blog and you've got the Diverse Abilities Network. So that's fabulous. Um, I've finished with the questions that I wanted to ask you, Mr Collins, so I'm going to now hand over back to the chair to see if the commissioners um, wish to ask you any questions. Just like to um, appreciate the gratitude for the time that you've given and the effort in putting all of this together. So thank you for your evidence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Um, I'll ask uh, first Commissioner Atkinson, who is in the room with you in Brisbane. Commissioner Atkinson, as you might know, has more than a passing experience with the Queensland legal system, and I'll ask her whether she has any questions. Or... Yes, I should probably first start with disclosures. Um, my son was a senior associate at Kingwood Mallison's um, at the same time that you were working there, although he's no longer there. Uh, and I should say I was a judge in the Supreme Court of Queensland in 2018 when you were involved in that litigation, although it was not litigation before me. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the diverse abilities and the advantages the employer gets mm -hmm. from having you at the workplace. So you started working from home uh, regularly in 2019 mm -hmm. and then your law firm, like many law firms, had to work out how they were going to keep their business going in 2020 with lawyers working at home. So would it be fair to say that your employer had the advantage that they had the example that you had set about how you can work from home, what adjustments you have to make, how you get into the rhythm, how you can keep up your productivity, notwithstanding that you're working from home. Would it be fair to say that that got an advantage to the law firm that you worked for? Oh, I, I think definitely um, and demonstrating to the, my partner who would have passed it along to other partners, you know, you can be comfortable that people are still doing the job that, you know, just because they're at home and you can't see them, you know, they're still doing everything that they need to do and they're still getting done what needs to be done. Thanks. Um, and the second thing I wanted to say was, um, in many ways, and this is personal to me, in many ways what you were talking about with diverse abilities and demonstrating to students and young people coming into the law how you can, the advantages of working in the law, it reminds me of what many of us as older women had to do for younger women or did for younger women when women in the law was an unusual thing. So similarly, by showing the example of doing it, of succeeding in it, but encouraging uh, others who are coming after you, it's is that a similar thing that you're doing with diversity in the law society? That's that's the goal. So I think the best way to demonstrate as with yourself is to just, you know, show show yourself doing it. Yeah. You know, show yourself doing the job. And then hopefully that can encourage, you know, future younger lawyers, you know, female lawyers or lawyers with disabilities or any type of diverse, any type of diversity, you know, to um, give it a go. Yeah. Thanks very much for your evidence, Mr. Collins. Um, Thank you. It's been wonderful to listen to you. Thank you. And to be, um, sorry, Chair, but to be in the same hearing room with Mr. Collins has been a real privilege. Thank you, Commissioner Atkinson. Um, Commissioner Galbally, I shall ask Commissioner Galbally if she has any questions, even though, of course, she is not a lawyer, but nonetheless. <laughs> Thank you very much um, for your evidence. Um, look, I wanted to ask you um, about a statement you made um, that, uh, that the, the adjustment of the workplace um, for everybody you know, you talked about the raising of chairs, um, you know, people having breaks, all sorts of adjustments to workplaces for everybody. And therefore, the adjustments for people with disability should be seen as part of just the term adjustment, you know, that that's an individual adjustment. I, I thought that was very interesting because it's always been separated you know, reasonable adjustments and then adjustments to everybody. So, one's yeah. for so I just wondered if you could comment further on that. 
Uh, it's becoming like that. I, mean, I think that's more of a recent thing, having the different adjustments, you know, at Malison, for example, they offer any employee hard adjustable desk or people have different chairs. So, yeah. I, you know, I think it's, we have to, I mean, I know I personally get stuck on the whole disability modifications, but I, you actually have to kind of take a breath and take a step back and go and look around and go, you know, they are making adjustments for other people. It's not just me. Yes. So it, that's kind of a change in attitude that I and the other people with disabilities have to go through. Um, because, you know, to, as you say to the employer, it doesn't cost any more getting a desk for one employee as opposed to another. So to them, it's just an adjustment. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan. I have no questions, Mr. Chair. I will thank Mr. Colin for uh, all, all for making his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Collins, I too thank you for your um, evidence. I find it interesting that you have chosen to work in a notoriously difficult area of litigation. The pressures of someone working in litigation, and I think you've already expressed that, are fairly considerable in terms of the pressures, the time that uh, is demanded of uh, solicitors and others who are working in that field. And you're also experiencing, you, you've told us, that what some would regard as the tyranny of billable hours, which characterizes legal practice. You've explained that at one point you asked for, and without any reservations, were uh, allowed to work from home. But your evidence suggests that you're extremely reluctant to take any further adjustments that might be someone in your position might well seek and be granted. And that raises a question that we haven't really heard much about before. We've talked about the need for employers to make adjustments. But that involves something reciprocal, and that is people with disability being prepared to accept adjustments that may be in their interests. I'm just interested in whether you have any reflections on that. Uh, I think, um, given my experience with having a disability, I, um, well, I'm, I'm used to adversity, and also I don't like feeling like I'm giving up. So um, that's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a personal success story for me when I can, when I just keep going at the same level and when I don't have to ask for anything different. But you're right. I think there, you know, in order for the right adjustments to be made, the, person, the people with disabilities need to, you know, be comfortable enough to ask. And as with, Anybody that's a work in progress, people, you know, people with disabilities need time to be comfortable with their disability. And for myself, with the progression of my disability, uh, it, it can be quite positive for me to, um, you know, I, I feel like I'm, like I'm, like I'm reaching my own, like I set my bar pretty high, and so by doing what I'm doing, I'm reaching the bar except for myself. Yes, thank you. And thank you again, uh, Mr. Collins, uh, for uh, your evidence. And uh, I'm sure on behalf of all commissioners, I wish you continued success uh, at uh, Mellison's and whatever else you choose to do with a legal uh, career. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Chair. I uh, yeah, it is now, I think, the time that we uh, adjourn for a break, and I think we're returning at 10 past 11, uh, Brisbane no, time. No. Oh, sorry? Uh, we, we've gone on a little over time, and I don't think that should be an impediment that we take the 20 minutes for the morning tea adjournment. So if we come back at 20 past 12, Sydney time, 20 past 11. Yes, we shall do that. Thank you. We'll adjourn uh, for uh, 20 minutes uh, and uh, resume at 12.20 Sydney time, 11.20 Brisbane time. Thank you. The Royal Commission is now...
Right. Yes. The Royal Commission is now resumed. Yes, uh, thank you, Ms. Eastman. Thank you, Commissioners. I think um, I was speaking to myself here without anyone hearing, and I wanted to Oh, no, welcome well, Commissioner Ryan and I were listening. Welcome um, people back. I apologise for that short delay. So we will return to Brisbane for our next two witnesses. Michael Pinney is the next witness and Ms Fraser will take his evidence. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr Pinney, good morning and thank you very much for coming to the Brisbane hearing room to give uh, evidence. Um, if you would be so good as to follow the instructions of Commissioner Atkinson's associate, who is in the same room as you are, and she will administer the oath to you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I will read you the oath. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Penny. Ms. Fraser will ask you some questions, and she is with you in the hearing room. Just so you are clear, uh, Commissioner Galbally joins the hearing from Melbourne. Commissioner Ryan is with me in the Sydney hearing room of the Royal Commission. Yes, Ms. Fraser. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Penny, your full name is Michael Gerard Penny. That's correct. And you have provided a statement, Mr. Penny, to this commission dated 19 November 2020? That's correct. And you have a copy of that statement with you now? I do, Ms. Rader. Thank you. And are there any uh, corrections or amendments that you would like to make to the statement? No, there isn't. And the statement is true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes, there is. Commissioners, you will find a copy of Mr. Peeney's statement in Tender Bundle Part A at Tab 9. I ask to tender this statement into evidence and that it be marked Exhibit 9.15. Yes, that can be done. And uh, Ms. Fraser, I wonder if you could keep in mind, just go a little more slowly. Certainly, Commissioner. Mr. Peeney, you have cerebral palsy? I do. And you have a graduate, uh, sorry, you have a Bachelor of Business Accountancy and a graduate diploma in taxation. I do. And you're a certified public accountant. I oh, am. Yeah. You have worked at the ATO, Mr. Peeney, haven't you, for 33 years? That's correct. And you've specifically worked in the Tax Council network within the ATO since 2005, haven't you? That's correct. You have successfully worked your way up through the ATO in the 33 years that you've been there, haven't you? That's correct. And what's your current position, Mr Penny? My current position is um, Assistant Commissioner Takes Care to Network. And Mr. Penny, is the position of Assistant Commissioner Tax Council Network at the ATO, is that one of the more senior roles? Yes, it is. The Tax Council Network within the ATO undertakes the highest risk and most complex tax issues arising within the ATO, is that correct? That's correct. And we're responsible for for me. The ATO view on a range of issues within the ATO. And how long have you been in that in your current role for? Since March two thousand and twelve. So almost nine years. That's good. So you worked your way up to that senior position within sort of if my maths is correct, within the first twenty four years of being at the ATO. Yes. That that would be correct. There's many different facets of the role that you um, fill at the ATO, isn't there? That's correct. Um, it's a senior position involving the provision of leadership um, in resolving issues within uh, 
the ATO and, and with respect to tax law, is that correct? That's correct, so it's, it's about prov- providing technical leadership and a range of issues associated with the income tax and superannuation <laughs> systems. Which, as we all know, are very complex systems. Um, <coughs> It involves interpreting um, and applying those complex tax laws. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, also applying it to a range of different scenarios of fat patterns. So applying those complex laws to a range of different factual scenarios and circumstances. That's correct. And in applying those complex laws, do you then provide advice on behalf of the ATO? Yes, so, so that's much internal and external. So if we look at the internal advice that you apply, um, provide within the ATO, is that provided to your colleagues in the appropriate way for them to interpret the tax law? That's correct. So they they would seek tax council advice on um, issues where the ATA may not, the law may not be clear. They come to us and see what did the ATA should bring on that particular issue. So people within the ATO come to you for clarity about the um, about the way that they should interpret the ATO um, legislation, That's the tax legislation. That's correct. And I will go one step further than I was the way to interpret, but the way to apply that particular piece of law. So advice in terms of um, interpreting and application. That's correct. And you mentioned a moment ago that you also provide advice externally Is that in the form of ATO rulings? That's correct, sir. And that the part of the role is public advice and guidance. We do that through public rules, through website guidance and platforms like that. And that the part of the role is in litigation matters was we engage cancer as solicitors to run the cases. Our role is to assist in children, the idea of the law. Um, we advise on it. The idea of the law would assist cancel that way. So, two of the aspects of your external engagement is in um, is in providing those rulings as as one part, and um, I think you also mentioned work with the website and and using the internet as a platform um, to provide external advice. But the next thing that you touched upon is your engagement with council. And by council, you mean external barristers? That's correct. Yep, who might be running cases um, for the ATO. That's correct. Um, And and the partner I was engaging with other stakeholders like our treasury colleagues, and the board of taxation. There's also a panel that the ATO um, gives advice 
without the anti avoidance provisions, and that panel contains external representatives as well. Okay. Um, so, in terms of some of the other external work that you do, um, what you were just talking about was some of the external advocacy work you do. Yes. And that's with, um, and um, I understand, and tell me if I'm wrong, but that involves external advocacy with um, accountants. Yeah, I, I probably wouldn't use the word advocacy. No, that, that might be a might be a hangover from my other work with the commission this week. So I apologise for that. I think a better word is consulting. Consulting. So the idea of a consult with external stakeholders. So part of the role is to consult or say a ruling or, or things like that or when there's yeah, exposure drive from legislation. So, so yeah, the, the ITA does a lot of external uh, consultation with the tax profession, accounts, the law profession, and, you know, professional bodies mm -hmm. as well. So it's a whole game, I guess. Sure. And, Michael, before we continue, I just want to let you know, if you want to take a break, you let me know at any time. And also I don't want you to feel at all rushed in answering my questions. We spoke just before we started. We've got 40 minutes. Um, and I'm very comfortable for you to take as much time as you would like. Thank you, Ms. And we're very comfortable in you taking as much time as you need in asking the question. Thank you, Commissioner. See, this applies to both of us, Mr. Peeney. Um, now, coming back to the questions, what I understood um, from what you just said is that, in fact, your work covers the full breadth of effectively providing that internal advice providing external rulings or, or making external rulings and then engaging with the external stakeholders, namely accountants, um, tax advisors, lawyers and so forth, to then effectively implement and explain the rulings that you've made. That's correct. Uh, and also to, to provide public advice and guidance on say, Recently, um, and the law that's been brought in to so say whenever there's new tax law that's passed, people like public advice and guidance. Mm. So we, that's another part of the role. And given that you focus on um, income tax and superannuation, the extent of your outward-facing public advice work and explanation of the tax system um, might be, must be quite extensive. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that. And just to clarify, I, do, I don't do a lot with the superannuation system these days. It's income tax. So um, while you might have had some historical involvement with superannuation, you're more focused now on the income tax. That's good. Um, and your position also includes both historically and the position that you're in now. You have had some involvement in the drafting of tax legislation. That's good. Prior to 2001, the ATA had carried and resisted the Office of Parliamentary Council and drafted legislation. So, in the, the late 90s and the early 2000s, I was in a role where I was assisting the Office 
the parliamentary cancel and draft is some of the tax laws. Which must place you in a good position. Having drafted it, you're now in a good position to help to interpret it and apply it. That's correct. Cause Actually, that's a common misconception, Miss Fraser. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mr Peeney, you have always uh, worked full-time. That's correct. And um, your role at the ATO, including your role now, often sees you um, needing to complete work after hours? I, I do, but I'm always conscious of work life balancing was but, but mine are the very nature of the world and they can be tired when um yeah a bit of extra work is required but the the idea is very good I recognize that that they say okay we could yeah give you a bit less time when it seems, yeah, the court there. So if I was to understand it, you effectively are an employee who um, does exactly what needs to be done to get the job done and your employer, if if possible, will then adjust or make some slight adjustments to your um, workflow after that time when you've worked significant overtime. That's great. My personal philosophy is always be get the job done and then you can yeah take a bit of a break afterwards. But yeah, by the very nature of some of our work you got deadlines, be caught deadlines. Legislation deadlines, things like that. Yes. Yeah. That, that personal philosophy that you just touched on, um, get the job done, do whatever needs to be done to get the job done, is the sort of personal philosophy that employers would like to see a lot of their employees have. Would you agree with that? I would be surprised. Um, and we have touched on... Uh, the extent of the external engagement that you inv um, are involved in as part of your role. And as a result of that external engagement, you are not in a position or in a role where you are permanently sitting behind a desk, are you? No. But by the very nature of the role, of course, yeah, go into the different ways. And you mentioned um, meeting with barristers. You do that at their chambers? Yes. And, and we meet with some of the professional bodies. That they can still be in the ATA, but they may be um, interstate, Sydney, Melbourne, or Canberra. And do you travel interstate um, to undertake that engagement? I do, although this year has, has been an exception, but yes, no, I travel, but, but I would when, when there is a need to, especially when we're engaging with external stakeholders. So when we're not living in a COVID-19 pandemic, um, you would ordinarily undertake interstate travel as part of your role. Yes. Um, speaking of interstate travel, the recruitment process for your current role um, saw you travel to Canberra. That's true. And I understand that you were interviewed by a panel of four people. That's true. As part of that, um, recruitment process. Did you ask for any uh, particular accommodations or modifications in relation to the interview process itself? No, I think the other thing I think I requested was that I could 
for for the the dog before was given that what time it would have been a very huge time. So, um, that was that was the other request. And we would say that asking to fly the night before an interview isn't necessarily a disability specific request, but a request that anybody might have made. I think so, Chris. Yeah, asking someone to, to get up at you know, four o'clock to get a at 434 to yeah. Canberra, especially when something is put in the job of the reproducing executive service position is, yeah, but so it would be a challenge for everyone. Mm. You wouldn't be likely to potentially perform at your best having been required to get up at four in the morning. Absolutely not, because when I'm tired, my speech tends to suffer a bit. So I'm too reacted to go there the night before to do more than tiredness, and therefore a French speech is is very important to me. I might just have a Glass of water? Sure. You let me know when you're ready. Thank you. Um, we were talking about whether or not there were any particular um, modifications or adjustments that you asked for as part of the interview process, and we got to the point where we had, um, or you'd mentioned one that I wouldn't personally consider to be a disability-specific modification, and that was flying down the night before. At the conclusion of the interview, you were asked, weren't you, whether you would like to put in a further written submission of 200 words to supplement what you had said in the interview. That's correct. Um, and you were offered this at the time when it was offered to you. First of all, let me go back. You didn't know that that was going to be offered to that, you? That's correct. It was a complete surprise to us. And when it was offered to you, it was at the conclusion of the interview and it was explained to you that it was offered to you in the context of Perhaps your speech had been a little slower and to give you that opportunity to say what you might not have been able to say in the 45 minutes that, provided. That's correct. Because, yeah, the need to be reserved for 45 minutes. The, um, the panel felt that it was our fair. I've been given that opportunity to, to put a further statement into the, the committee. And did you take up that opportunity? I did. I read the way I thought. I, I don't. I did. And, um, I did okay. The interview was my, my sort of feeling, but I thought because it's such a senior position, you don't get these opportunities too often. So I did take up the offer and put in that further 200 word statement. So while you didn't um, necessarily feel the need to because you felt that you had performed well, you saw it as a good opportunity, we're going to come back to that word opportunity, um, given the senior nature of the role that you were applying for. That's great because these roles, yeah, we, because they're very senior because I'm, I made it all the way to the interview because as, 
That's when I get in the interview, get stuck on Twitter, the most difficult part mm. of any recruitment process. So that's why I, I took out that opportunity. Because you wanted to give yourself the very best chance at getting the job. That's correct. Um, so you would describe yourself as surprised but pleased to have received that offer. That's correct because I never, for whatever reason, I've never asked for any assistance that I didn't think I needed. We're going to um, talk a little bit about that now, about the extent to which you are either able to or you personally have asked for any sorts of assistance. So just to recap, you've worked at the ATO for 33 years and you've been in your current role for nine years. Given that it's quite a senior position, you would have applied for a number of different roles working your way up the ladder? That's correct. And um, does the ATO have a system whereby an applicant like yourself or like any other person could uh, identify that they have a disability? They do. And how does that system work? Well, you can identify as having a disability and then there's a further box that you can take to request any assistance from at the interview should, should you get the interview. So there's effectively two stages to the process. The first is that you can identify that you have a disability. Yes. And the second is that having identified, you can then request particular assistance. Yes. I I should perhaps clarify that was back in in March 2012 because... You haven't had to apply for another job since then. (laughs) Necessary. And Michael, I'm particularly interested in your experience and what you did. So, um, is it that you have historically, up until 2012, when you last applied for a job, did you check the box, so to, so to speak, that identified that you have a disability? I did. And having checked that box, did you then go further and at any time request any? Assistance or modifications? No. Why not? I guess from because of my sort of general nature of being independent, so I could do this second way. Um, I just uh, because. I've been in the ATA for, for quite a number of years. People knew me, so I didn't see the need to, to um, request that assistance. Having said that, I would encourage people these days that assistance is offered. Take it up, but that that was just a combination of, of your experience. Of my personal experience, I, I guess my my need to be independent, and also because I don't, I feel well done. The idea of my 
of 12 and even before that. So just breaking that down, um, you told me that you didn't ask for those um, modifications or any kind of assistance because you have an overwhelming desire or a strong desire, they're my words, not yours, to be independent. That's correct. And you also said that you didn't do it because you had worked at the ATO for a long time. That's correct. But you then also did acknowledge that you would say, do as I say, not as I do. So you would encourage other people to seek that assistance if it's available. Absolutely, Chris. It's difficult enough as it is getting through any recruitment process. Yep. So if that assistance is provided, take it up. Just coming back to um, what you said about I didn't ask for assistance because I had always worked at the ATO and I felt that they knew me well. The reality, however, is, Mr Peeney, you have never asked for any assistance, even when you started at the ATO, have you? That's good. And in your statement, um, you say that you didn't do that because you were concerned that to, um, that to do so would bring your disability into sharper focus. That's correct, but that statement's going to be seen in the context. That was, yeah, 1987. Yep. I was in my, yeah, mid 20s, and he said, I can't, you got the job, you still a bit. Self conscious that yeah, he got this disability, and yeah. he didn't want to highlight it more. But say, I need this, or I need that. Again, uh, uh, I would encourage people in the same circumstances to, to think if. He did, did that assistance. To seek it out. To seek it out. But it is interesting, the point that you make, in that a lot of younger people with disabilities, when they're starting their career, they might be at a different point in their own disability journey and maturity. Absolutely. And they might be less likely to ask for those assistances or modifications. Absolutely. Which probably make it even more important for the employer to draw out of them that information. That's correct. Mr Peeney, over the years that you've worked at the ATO, you would have worked with a great number of people. Is that correct? That's correct. And you would say that your colleagues have gotten to know you. That's correct. You now lead a team at the ATO? I do lead a team. I have Every small number of direct reports, but the very, the, the very nature of the role requires leadership across to, the board. To a broad spectrum. So your leadership a, a, applies to a broad spectrum of people within the ATO, and you have a number of people who report to you. Um. Would you agree that working with you, and this might be a difficult question to answer because I'm asking you a question about what other people might think of you, would you agree that working with you is likely to have had a positive impact on your colleagues' perceptions of disability? I would hope so. That's very modest, Mr Penny. I would tend to say yes. Thank um, you, Mr Penny. Mr. Peeney, you don't experience any negative attitudes or bias against you in your workplace at the ATO on account of your disability, do you? That's correct. And I would go one step further this way. Whenever I dealt with externals, there's been no form of yeah, issues. To do with my disability, sure, 
muy güey de desigual al, al, al saber ella es mal de cuatro montes muy en la boca baja a ver de la so you as well. and sorry to cut you off then um you would say that you have had positive engagements with both those that you work inside the ato with and when you go outside for your external engagement while those people might not always agree with your interpretation of the tax law no doubt um you haven't experienced any negative um attitudes or biases as no, a result of your decision. Absolutely not. But that's an interesting distinction for us to draw because what that tells me is that when people interact with you in a work setting, you don't experience those biases, you personally. But that is not always your experience in interacting in the broader community, is it? That's correct. Can you tell me a little bit about your experiences? interacting in the broader community. Okay. I can I can give you two extreme examples and then give you two less extreme but more common two extreme examples were in two thousand and five or there about I was on my way to a, a meeting with the tax profession and corporate advisors to deal with the consolidation provisions of the tax act. So it was a fair one. Seriously. Seriously. It was in the state and in getting from the airport to the building. I want sort of, I don't want to get too much detail, but the driver of the car that I was in thought it would be very helpful to explain to me that a library is where you read books. There was a correctional centre. He explained to me that's where people are locked up. And right. then we came across the bridge. He explained to me that was a big bridge. So right. I sort of went for that contrast straight into this important meeting to deal with the consolidation provisions of the income tax assessor. But the other extreme examples, one day I went and got my lunch, and yeah, you get the usual questions, white bread, 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 etc. I was asked, do you want butter? Just to make sure I understand the question. The person did the the butter reaction. So again, you go from that back to your work. Back to work. The, the less extreme examples uh, I quite often get referred to in the third person. Mm -hmm. And the kind of way people address me in a loud voice. Mm -hmm. So they the there's a less extreme, but, but I, I think it gives you that context that well, I mean, you're in the workplace dealing with colleagues on important matters, and some like five minutes later, you're dealing with this, this. ill informed individuals. <laughs> If Thank I could you. call it that. Thank you, Ms. And Mr. Peeney, um, just to touch on that story that you told us about the, the person who was driving you to your meeting uh, who felt the need to inform you about what a library was or 
what a prison was or the existence of a large bridge. Um, it strikes me that you told me that that happened in 2005 or thereabouts. That's good. And that tells me that that conversation had quite an impact on you because you now still in 2020 can reflect on that. Would you agree with that? That's, that's correct. So that was just something that's so unexpected. You sort of, why I reflect on that is I'm sitting there thinking the person that the day that what my position was, like in that time I wasn't an assistant commissioner, but I was still, um, yeah, somewhere. You were in a senior position. That's right. And that did I that I would talk to me with this ex yeah, the tax profession to discuss yeah, the consolidation provisions of the, the income tax act. Mm. Um, Mr. P, I I'm conscious of the time. Uh I'd just like to um, finish up with a couple of comments and, and just a couple more questions for you. Um, your career is a clear example of what can be achieved by a person with a disability in a workplace setting when they are given an opportunity. And from what you've told us, it's your experience uh, that a person with a disability who is given a workplace opportunity, um, that person will work just as hard if not harder, than someone without a disability in that same role. Would you agree with that? That's correct. And from my discussions with you, this is because, um, in your view, they will be careful not to waste the opportunity that has been given to them. That's correct. Mr Penny, I would like to thank you very much for your evidence that you have given today, and I would like to... Um, finish up by asking you whether or not there is anything that you would like to tell the Commission that we've not covered off today. Thank you, Ms. Ray. I would just want to quickly touch on that point a bit. Opportunity and attitude to change, which comes first. Maybe in the perfect world, if attitude and change was able to take place, we wouldn't sort of have to push the provision of opportunity mm -hmm. for people with disability for employment. But if we can't get that attitude and change, we need to somehow provide more opportunities because providing those opportunities will invite attitude and change and it will just happen organically, I would hope. So, so without... Um independent attitudinal change, in your view, the only way to make that change is to give a person with a disability an opportunity, put them in the workplace, see other people interacting with that person in the workplace, see what they can achieve, and the change will occur. That's great because the colleagues will see a person with a disability in the workplace they will go home and tell their children, their partners, their friends, oh, I work with the people with the disability, and they go, oh, wow. The flow on effect. Exactly. So that, that would be my hope. But I think we may have to do something to, to provide those opportunities to get that. And the change. Go. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Penny. I'm going to pass you over to uh, the chair um, to inquire as to whether or not any of the commissioners have any questions for you. Thank you, Ms. Fraser. Thank you very much. Um, I shall ask Commissioner Atkinson, who is with you in the um, hearing room. I'm pretty sure Commissioner Atkinson is a taxpayer, so uh, she may have some questions. <laughs> Mr. Pinney, thank you very much for your evidence. And I must say that I think your giving evidence today, as well as your work, is helping to lead that attitudinal change that you speak about. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Commissioner Galbraith, do you have any questions for Mr. Pinney? Um, thank you very much for your evidence. I'm just interested in your very last sentence in your statement paragraph 23, when you say, whilst I have been afforded an opportunity at the ATO, there is scope for legal and policy infrastructure to open up the opportunities for people with disabilities to work. And just thinking about the Australian Public Service rates of employment halving, you know, over the last couple of years, um, I just wondered if you had any comments about what you'd like to see. Thank you, Commissioner. I know the APS put out the disability employment strategy last Thursday on International Day of Disability. And that strategy covers the year. 2020 to 2025. So I would hope that that strategy would be a catalyst to, to provide those opportunities. And I think it's good that the public set their seats to be leading the way in some of this work and provide, provide these, these strategies. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. I don't have any uh, questions, Mr. Chair. Mr. Penny, uh, thank you very much uh, for coming and giving evidence. We're very grateful to you for having shared your experiences and in particular the journey you have had at the Australian Taxation Office. I think as uh, Commissioner Atkinson indicated, it's extremely important that we not only explore the barriers that face people with disability in seeking to uh, enter and remain in the labour force, uh, but uh, we should also be exploring the opportunities that are available for people with disability your evidence has allowed us to do exactly that. So thank you very much. We greatly appreciate uh, your contribution to the work of the Royal Commission. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Ms. East. We're still uh, in Brisbane. Ms. Zerner is taking our next week. Ms. Zerner, all right, thank you. Commissioners, the next witness is Ms. Rachel Cruz. She is appearing from Darwin in the Northern Territory by video link. Yes, we'll just wait for Ms. Cruz to appear on the screen. Yes, I think we have Ms. Cruz now. Yes, Ms. Zerner, um, what, what is to happen now? Um, I, I, if, if firstly, um, Ms. Cruz's affirmation could be taken, please, or for affirmation. Very well. Uh, Ms. Cruz, thank you very much for coming to give evidence to the Royal Commission. Uh, I will ask you to follow the instructions of my associate who will administer the oath uh, to you. Thank you very much. I will read you the oath. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, 
and nothing but the truth. I did. Thank you very much, Ms. Cruz. Now, um, Ms. Werner will ask you some questions, just so you're aware of where everybody is, because it can be a little confusing. Ms. Werner is in the Brisbane hearing room, together with Commissioner Atkinson. Commissioner Galbally, who uh, I hope you can see on screen, is in Melbourne, and Commissioner Ryan is with me in our Sydney hearing room, and you are in Darwin, as I assume you already know. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I, Chair, at the outset, I want to um, indicate that Ms. Cruz's evidence will be provided in two parts today. Part one will be her evidence comprising a discussion in regards to Ms. Cruz's statement and also the respondents from Project 21, and we'll talk about that in Ms. Cruz's evidence. That evidence will be taken in public, that is live streamed from the hearing room. Part two will be evidence that will be taken in private, which means that the hearing room will be closed to the public or the hearing in general will be closed to the public. And this means that people following the broadcast will not be able to access the next section of evidence and can take um, the lunch adjournment as planned. The hearing room will then be closed to all the parties with leave to appear with the second part of Ms. Cruz's evidence being taken. The hearing will be adjourned after the conclusion of part two of Ms. Cruz's evidence. So I turn now to part one of the evidence. Ms. Cruz, can you tell the commissioners your full name, please? Rachel Jane Cruz. And it's correct, isn't it, that you've provided a statement to the Royal Commission? Yes, that's correct. And have you had the opportunity to review that recently? Yes, I have. And is it true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes, it is. Commissioners, you will find a copy of Miss Cruz's statement in Tender Bundle Part A at Tab 10. I ask that her statement be tendered into evidence and that it be marked as Exhibit 9.16. There is an annexure. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. There, there is also an annexure to Mrs. Cruz, Ms. Cruz's statement, which is included in the tender bundle Part A at Tab 11. And I ask, please, that that document be admitted into evidence and marked as 9.16.1. Yes, that can be done. Thank you, Chair. Ms. Cruz, you're the Executive Officer of Down Syndrome Northern Territory, which is commonly called DSAT. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And you're based in Darwin, as I said in the introduction, and you're responsible for establishing Project 21, which I also referred to in the introduction. Yes. Can you please provide us um, a little bit of an overview of what Project 21 is? Project 21 is a post-school-based learning centre for people with intellectual disabilities so that they can have a pathway from year 12 from school toward adulthood. Mm -hmm. And how was it started? What was the impetus of starting Project 21? My own daughter, who is now 25, she was in her high school years. And I could see as she was coming towards the end that there was nowhere for her to go to further her education, like her sister was furthering her education. And I was really had limited choices as to where uh, my daughter could go um, or whether I would even have to give up work to go back home to look after her. So I said about thinking, how can we extend the pathway from school, but also incorporate some work training and some life skills training and some social connections so that she can continue on towards adulthood and working and contributing just like anybody else. Mm -hmm. And how did you start out? Was there funding? No, no funding. Um, and I'd had this idea for a while and was trying to put it together. And uh, a couple of her friends came to see me and they hadn't got a job. And um, that instilled me to look around the complex where my office currently was and to rent a couple of rooms and um, set about just putting desks and anything I could find in my home and other parents' homes together to make a learning environment. And I then invited the uh, ministers and various departmental heads of health, education and business to walk through the environment with students working in there to provide an opportunity for them to see 
what post-school learning could look like. Uh, fortunately, they liked the model and um, gave me some seed funding to continue. And when, when was that, um, that you started that rudimentary process and where it's come to today? Yes, I mean, that was in a, a small sort of 50 square metre um, office in a shopping centre in a suburb in Darwin. I mean, we've now got uh, 200 square metres of classroom and kitchen and functioning uh, classroom with lots and lots of lovely technology and things. We've progressed really well in the, the eight years that we've born from that tiny little place to now. Mm -hmm. And Miss Cruz, you said eight years. So when it started at the outset, can you give us an idea of the number of uh, participants and where it's at to today? Yes, I, I took the two young people who'd come to visit me who were so bereft because they didn't have any work anymore. I asked four other friends of mine who had um, adult uh, sons and daughters in the age range that I thought that they would want something. And I started with six students, one lecturer and myself. Mm -hmm. And it's grown to today. So can you give us an idea of what the participant um, numbers are today and the uh, resources available? Uh, we have 26 uh, young people enrolled in Project 21 now, all on differentiated pathways towards employment in some way, but uh, also connected through social and health and well-being activities. And a total of 60 young people actually use the space for a whole variety of reasons. So the space has manifested itself into other programs other than the Project 21 culture. Mm -hmm. Just staying with Project 21, as <coughs> I understand, there's also... Um, some social enterprises that are linked in some regards to Project 21. Can you just tell us briefly about those social enterprises? Yes, the Down Syndrome Association Northern Territory um, started two social enterprises in 2013. Uh, one was a container deposit um, recycling centre and uh, also a recycling shoe shop. And both of those were part of my thinking around, we need a safe space to actually practice whatever we are learning in the classrooms, um, to differentiate the workspace, but also to give a range of work experience, not a, just a one-off um, activity that people uh, would be experiencing, but a whole range of whether it was retail or recycling. And so those two components add value to the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the ultimate goal when we're looking at Project 21 and the social enterprises, and I think you had said um, earlier in your evidence about getting people into work. So is it going through that pathway to get some sort of work as an outcome? That is a main criteria for enrolling in Project 21 is that that young person understands they want work and that the family understand that we are working towards work and independence. Um, mm -hmm. So the social enterprises are one stepping stone toward that because I don't have access to mainstream employment places where I can um, put young people for various hours in the day or shifts where I can expose them to a range of um, work opportunities. They aren't available to me. Mm -hmm. And, and Miss Cruz, I want to just move away from the introduction of Project 21 just in regards to a recent survey that you conducted on behalf of the Commission with the young people that you work with, um, there was 12 young people that were enrolled who were enrolled in Project 21 and they had the opportunity of um, having some questions posed to them and then having the collation of that data in regards to those questions. That's right, isn't it? Yes, that's correct. And in your statement, you've provided some observations that you've made in regards to the responses that the young people made in regards to that survey. Yes, that's correct. And commissioners, the responses of the young people are uh, annexed to Miss Cruz's statement. I don't need to go through those with you, but there are a number of examples of responses from the young people to the questions that were posed. Um, I will focus on a couple of those questions as we go through further with Miss Cruz's evidence. Um, now, they were posed a number of questions, and, and one of the questions was um, about the experience of finding work or finding a job, and you've indicated in your statement that there was a commonality in responses. So, for example, there's a number of references to uh, the same retail store, um, th those sorts of things. Can you just explain why that is? That's because there is a transition to work program happening in year 10, 11, 12 of specialist education here in Darwin, and they have a range of work opportunities, but they are very restricted. 
And so the, the same places are used time and time again. So most students will have a placement in one of those areas. It's not necessarily an area of motivation for that student, but it is to try and um, sort of simulate some sort of work experience. So. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. And in the questions that the students were asked, um, you, uh, there was some data asked of whether, whether they were working at the time. And so uh, one of the students was in full-time wages, one on supported wages and two part-time on full wages and three on part-time supported wage, three on part-time supported wage assessment at 50% of their casual hourly rate, and four were in volunteer positions with the potential to move to paid employment. Taking that cohort, and the question was asked in relation to how they feel about having a job, um, what was the sense of um, responses in regards to that feeling of having a job? so very positive and uh, you can see that the responses to how you feel are eloquent and uh, that there's lots and lots of sentence construction in that it makes people feel very positive and happy and content and stable uh, mentally mm -hmm. strong and resilient so they all enjoy being able to identify with contributing somewhere in a workplace uh, in their mm -hmm. life and for example, if I just um, refer to one of the responses, it was, it made me feel, it made me very happy at the laundry. I had a friend at school I know, um, another person, and I see my students at the shops and say hello. So it was very much about feeling happy about being um, employed and having a job. Absolutely, because these young people see their brothers and sisters getting work and they see their family members getting work. And this is a normal part of growing up. Um, so access to work is critical for their own self-identity and self worth um, Another in interesting observation I thought and, and um, in regards to the responses, um, and certainly if the commissioners would like to go to it but they don't have to, is it page two um, of the survey, it was in regards to how they were getting a job. And I noticed that um, four of the participants had indicated that my mum helped me or my mum found me the job or my sister found me the job. I'm just wondering, um, in your experience, uh, is that a common experience for people um, in this area of disability about finding employment? In my experience, yes, it is. And it's because the other structures that are in place to find anybody a job have broken down or they are inaccessible to this particular cohort of people. So the parents need to actually fill this gap and do this role uh, because there isn't anyone else who can do it. So you mm -hmm. reach out into your own community networks, your own networks and try and find, if it's not your son or daughter, somebody else's son or daughter, uh, an opportunity for work. Um, that there aren't the, the, the structures there to enable them to, to get their own jobs and it falls to the family. Mm -hmm. Ms. Cruz, I want to now move on to some barriers that you've identified, and that's through not only the survey, but your eight years with Project 20 work, 21, your work with Descent, but then also having a daughter uh, with Down syndrome. Um, and in regards to a number of barriers that you've identified in your statement, I wondered if we could just touch on a couple of those. Um, and just starting with that transition from school, which was the impetus, as I understand, for setting up Project 21. Can you just tell us a little bit about that transitioning from school, including, and this is touching on your evidence before about um, perhaps going into work experience that was common to everyone? That's right. Uh, there is nothing. Um, you really are, you leave year 12 and for a young person with an intellectual disability, suddenly their life changes. They've got no routine, no structure. They don't see their friends anymore. Uh, my own daughter said, have my friends died because she didn't see them anymore um, and they weren't in her life anymore. Um, so the whole family dynamic changes post year 12 and the family take back on that, um, that challenge of what are we going to do now? Um, so there is that element that there is nothing there, um, but the element is there to, to create educational pathways, but they just can't access those educational pathways for other people. The work experience that they've had at school, when they go to try and get those jobs, those places are either other training work placements, so they aren't available, 
and we haven't tapped into what motivates this young person anyway and skilled them up. So they lose out on both sides. They don't have the skills to look at the jobs they want to do and they can't go back to where they had the work experience in the first place. So they're mm -hmm. left without anything. Mm -hmm. And because of leaving school, and I think you refer to it in your statement, is that some people, when they leave school, not, aren't necessarily ready for school, are ready for employment, that, you know, that there might be some more time required with these people and learning. Can you just explain that a little bit? Yes. How can you go from a specialist centre, which perhaps even has... Um, you know, a fence around it and classrooms and where you know everybody in that environment, suddenly to a mainstream environment. That leaves somebody very vulnerable. They do need to learn the skills of adolescence and adulthood, of sitting alongside people who they don't know very well, um, of being able to share or not share, ask a question. Um, these skills of confidence um, in their own sort of sense of being are not focused on uh, post year 12. There isn't anywhere for them to learn those natural skills of adolescence that we all learn when we go through university or, or go into our jobs. So um, that's why I think that they need, that our young people need further extension around maturation, how the world works, how government works, how discrimination works, uh, their human rights, a whole heap of curriculum activities that we can deliver to round out their knowledge about what they can contribute to in the first place and what they want to contribute to. Mm -hmm. And just in regards to, uh, to their contribution, um, you have uh, indicated that um, there is a lack um, of employment spaces. So you might get through that maturation period, do that additional training, but then when it comes to places and you refer to that, um, it, for example, even if going to a DES, that there's just the lack of opportunities. Can you just describe that a little bit? And perhaps Darwin might have something to do with it. I think you, 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 you're concerned about the, the, uh, the employment jobs that are available. That's right. Darwin is a small market at the end of the day. And, you know, both specialist schools still um, transition on seven, eight, 12 young people into the sector every year. Um, and the DES is cold call employers to try and find these placements. Well, that's, that's just too far a gap between leaving school and the expectation of having a job. So we don't have the number and diversity of em employers or spaces where these young people can naturally filter in, and especially when they don't have the skills to actually operate in a mainstream environment anywhere. The gap is mm -hmm. too wide and the opportunities too few. Miss mm -hmm. Cruz, just in conclusion, and you've identified some barriers and the commissioners have the benefit of your statement, but at paragraph 21, I don't need to take you to there, but it's your concluding paragraph. And you say that despite all the barriers that you've identified, young people with Down syndrome and other intellectual disabilities can and do engage with a process that support their learning and builds confidence and skills to achieve. And you make a, a, a reflection on the survey results there. Um, and you say that from your perspective, when you're looking at that, that they want to contribute and they want to be a part of the workforce. Is that right? Absolutely. They, they see their brothers and sisters and other people and their YouTube, you know, favourites, all part of life. And um, where, where's their opportunity? They, they can and do understand and recognise that contributing is a really great thing to do. So we need to keep that positivity from year 12 until that point of time where they get their open employment position and find their valued place in society. That's the gap that I'm talking about. And that's the gap that I've noticed, recognised and tried to create some structure to bridge. Thank you, Ms. Cruz. I'm very grateful for your evidence. I'm going to move now on to part two. So we've addressed your statement. Chair, I'd request um, that the following directions be made to ensure the just, compliance. Just, sorry, just oh, before we, we do that, uh, perhaps I could ask while we're still in uh, public mode, whether any of the commissioners have any questions. Quite right, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll start uh, with Commissioner Atkinson. Do you have any no, questions, thank you. Ms. Cruz? Commissioner no, Gilbert? Thank thank no, thank you. And Commissioner Ryan? Can I just, one small clarification. Project 21, is that 
um, a school leaver employment service. Is that an example of one of those things or is it something different? And I take it your clients now access that service through the NDIS, do they? Uh, yes, it, it, we are not a DES or an ADE. Um, we do have clients now who can access uh, Project, in, uh, Project 21 through their NDIS plans. And are you a, what is understood to be a school leaver employment service or is, is it something else? At, at this stage, the SLES, the SLES, um, has not been utilised for Project 21. Um, historically, it's been very much an ADE um, line item through NDIS, we continue to explore that. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Pierre. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask the, about funding. Is that the only source of funding that you receive? Yes, um, we no longer receive a grant for Project 21. Um, so our funding is dependent on what we as the Down Syndrome Association MT can raise um, and some student fees we've done in the past the NDIS is obviously making an impact on our ability to stabilise and grow. Thank you very much. All right, I'll come back then to uh, Ms Zerner. Thank you, Chair. If I can now move on to part two of Ms Cruz's evidence. And in doing so, I request that the following direction be made to ensure compliance with non-publication order CTH DNP 00064. Part two of Ms. Cruz's evidence is to be taken in private in accordance with the general powers of the Commission to ensure compliance with non-publication order CTH DNP 00064. Secondly, that the live webcast stream be ceased to ensure compliance with the non-publication order. And thirdly, parties with leave to appear be excluded from hearing room, including the virtual hearing room and real-time transcript while part two of Ms. Cruz's evidence is being taken to ensure compliance with the non-publication order. Yes, um, thank, I ask, you. thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, <clears throat> I'll make those uh, directions as requested by Ms. Erna. They are done by reference to um, non-publication order CTH DNP 00064 which uh, is a direction not to publish that was made pursuant to section six, capital D, bracket three, close bracket of the Royal Commissions Act, 1902. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Now, do, do you want uh, to adjourn for a few minutes to allow this uh, private hearing to take place? That, that'd be very helpful, Chair, if you could please adjourn the hearing. Yes, we'll adjourn for five minutes to enable the adjustments to be made. The Royal Commission is now... The Royal Commission is now resumed. Yes, Ms. East. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. I can see uh, we have the three members of our panel on the screen, but just before we get to them, can I update the commissioners and those following the live stream about the arrangements for this afternoon? So we'll start now and our next session will continue for 45 to 50 minutes. Then we'll have a short break and then our final witness of the day will be Dr Lisa Stafford and uh, her evidence will probably take us to around 4.30 this afternoon. So at this point, um, I'll hand over to Ms Zerna, who is in the Brisbane hearing room, to start our next witnesses. And we have the panel of three. I'm looking forward to hearing their evidence. Thank you, Commissioners. Yes, thank you, Ms Eastman. Uh, yes, Ms Zerna. Thank you, Chair. Our next witnesses are from the National LGBTI Health Alliance. Um, Chair, if I could ask that the uh, affirmation is taken, please, first. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, all three of you uh, for uh, coming to the Royal Commission, at least remotely, and uh, giving evidence today. I will ask you please to follow the instructions of my associate who will administer the affirmation to you. I will read you all the affirmation. At the end, please all say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bath, Mr. Comensoli, and Ms. Morgan. Um, just so you are aware, uh, Ms. Zerner appears in the Brisbane hearing room. Uh, Commissioner Atkinson is in that same hearing room. Commissioner Galbally, whom you can see on screen, is in Melbourne. And Commissioner Ryan is with me in the Sydney hearing room. I'll now ask Ms. Zerner to ask you some questions. Thank you, Chair. Just to begin with, could you each introduce with your full name and your role at the LG National LGBTI Health Alliance, please? My name is Nikki Bath and I'm the CEO. Uh, my name is Daniel Comensoli and I'm the Policy and Research Coordinator. My name is Hannah Morgan and I'm the Coordinator of the Employable Q Project. We might Thank need you. to get a little better sound, so uh, I just wonder whether we can be given advice as to what should be done. Is it possible to be any closer to whatever microphone there is in the system that you, you were using? Okay. We'll just adjust our table. Okay. Thank you. It's just that it was a little bit hard to hear. That was all. Yeah. And we'll, Thank you. We'll try and speak up. Excellent. And perhaps um, as we're going to one-on-one, -on -one, um, certainly, perhaps if someone needs to move into the microphone, they can do that. But we'll just see how we go. Um, it's the case, isn't it, that you haven't provided a, a statement um, in relation to this hearing, but you've provided some submissions which have gone into the Commission. But for the purpose of today, there was an outline of evidence that was agreed um, between um, yourselves to be put into evidence today. Is that right? Yes, that's yes. correct. Commissioners, can I please ask that a copy of the outline of the National LGBTI Health Alliance, which can be found in Tender Bundle Part A at tab 25, um, that this be tendered into evidence and that it be marked as Exhibit 9.17? Yes, Commissioners, the, out there are the outline of evidence can be marked in that way. Thank you, Chair. There are a number of annexures. There's five annexures to the outline, which are included in Tender Bundle, Bundle Part A, at tabs 26 through to 30. I also request that those annexures are tendered into evidence and that they be marked as um, 9.17.1 through to 19.17.5. I think you mean 9.17.1 to 5. I do, thank you, and Chair. On that, on that basis, the answer is yes. Thank you, Chair. What I'd like to do today is really look at two parts of your evidence. The first is really in relation to, I guess, some theory uh, about intersectionality in relation to LGBTI issues and disability. And in the second part, I'd like to explore with you a fairly new resource um, which was launched by the Alliance. Is it okay if I call it the Alliance? Yeah. Thank you. By the Alliance on the 4th of November 2020. So perhaps if I turn first to you, Ms. Bath, as being the CEO, can you just give us a brief overview of what the Alliance does and what it's all about? Um, thank you. Uh, so the Alliance, we're the National um, Health Peak Organisation in Australia for LGBTI um, Community Controlled Health Organisation. We provide health-related programs, services and research focused on lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex people intersex people and other sexuality, gender, bodily, diverse people and communities. We also have regular members, affiliate members, uh, associate members, as well as individual members. And we recognize that people's genders, bodies, relationships and sexualities affect their health and well-being in every domain of their life. The Alliance purpose is to provide a national focus to improve health and well-being outcomes for LGBTI people through policy, advocacy, representation, research, and also capacity building. And we're working across mental health, suicide prevention, palliative care, aging and aged care, disability, and we have a broad policy advocacy agenda. Thank you, Ms. Bath. I understand there's been a recent name change, is that right? Or about to be? Yes, indeed. Um, our AGM occurred just uh, over a week or so ago now, and we will be known as LGBTIQ Plus Health Australia. Thank you. I might turn to Mr. Comensoli now, and I just wanted to explore a little bit about this concept, which we hear about of being of minority stress. 
um, in relation to the LGBTI community. Before we get to disability, if we can talk about that minority stress, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, so minority stress was a theory that was first posited by Dr. Ilan Meyer, and it's a conceptual framework for understanding the, the significant health disparities that LGBTI people continue to experience to this day. And it's just really helpful um, in explaining that when individuals are a member of a stigmatized minority group, that the disharmony, if you like, between those individuals and the dominant culture can be onerous and the stress that derives from that process can be quite significant. And so it's a really useful tool to explain that the unique stresses that we're um, persistently exposed to, the stresses include stigma, prejudice and discrimination. In combination, they create quite a hostile and stressful social environment. And because of that, that then leads to um, the heightened instances of mental health issues and um, an increased disease burden for our communities. Mm -hmm. And so I, oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, and just on that, I guess, in regards to that ongoing minority stress in relation to identity, um, in, in regards to LGBTI, um, there's also this concept of, cons of sort of hiding identity, I guess, in regards, because in some respects, uh, for some members of the community, it's an invisible identity. Is that right? Absolutely. And I think... Uh, there is research evidence that shows that for lesbian, gay and bisexual people um, in the workplace, they do engage in identity disclosure and concealment strategies in order to avoid experiences of discrimination on the one hand and a need for self-integrity on the other. And on the subject of minority stress, there are some unique um, stresses that occur in the workplace for our communities. And if I could just briefly go over some of those stresses, um, for the be benefit of the commission. Um, so the first one is actual experiences of discrimination that people face, and that can be conceptualized to range from subtle forms. Uh, so for example, being excluded from workplace social events to more overt forms. So um, slows that um, uh, occur in the workplace. The second one is the expectations of stigma. And that arises from broader social <coughs> cultural stigmatization of LGBTI people more broadly. And third, there is internalized heterosexism, and that is the internal denigration of being LGBTI. And lastly, um, as you alluded to, there is um, the concealment of identity or histories or experiences. And what we see in the research is that there are three main identity management strategies that sexuality diverse people will utilize in the uh, employment context. And so the first one of those strategies is counterfeiting. And that really just refers to um, presenting a false identity that's uh, uh, not lesbian, gay or bisexual. And the second one is avoiding. And that really just um, involves actively avoiding um, any discussion of their personal lives, their families, their relationships. And also that involves maintaining quite strict boundaries around our work and personal life. And then finally, there's also integrating, which is being completely open and honest about um, their identity and experience. And I think, it's reasonable, I think it's reasonable to assume that we can apply that to transgender diverse people and intersex people in the workplace. And um, what we see um, when people utilize these concealment strategies in the workplace, we know that that actually results in poorer mental health outcomes and a decrease in um, job satisfaction and commitment. And also importantly, I think that constant vigilance around interacting with others in the workplace for fear of harm and expectation of rejection, that also results in poorer mental health outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, can, can I, I just pause you there, Mr. Kamasoli. I just wanted to um, go back to the um, counterfeiting and avoiding and those particular issues and there was a witness who gave evidence earlier in the week and he had said that um, he was concerned about the clothes that he wore or how he did his hair um, because he was gay and he was concerned about that. Is that what you're talking about in the sense of really not putting themselves out there as to what perhaps they may present themselves outside of the workplace? 
Yes, and I think um, that relates to just providing a safe, welcoming and affirming workplace environment, regardless of one's sexuality, gender or intersex status. So yes, that's correct. Okay, and it's the case, isn't it, that we're talking here before we even get to a disability. So you're dealing with the issue of uh, LGBTI identity. Um, and I wanted to just pass now to Miss Morgan, and we're going to come to the Employable Q Toolkit in a moment. But part of that process was that you actually um, had a co-design process and you were talking with people who are LGBTI and also um, had a disability. And I'm just wondering from those people you spoke to, was that their experience in relation to the workforce um, issues that they faced? Yes, absolutely. Um, certainly it was this constant navigation of what they could talk to people at work about, how they could present at work, disclosing or not disclosing, which we'll be speaking a bit more about um, today. Um, and I, if you don't mind, I'd like to use a quote that came out of the research with the co-design team just to illustrate this point further. And the quote is as follows. There is this whole issue of having to decide, am I going to divulge or disclose my disability or my sexuality or gender identity? And then you have to assess, how is everyone going to respond? So it's this constant thinking process, which is exhausting, that goes into um, just really showing up at work. Thank you. And I think in the evidence outline, there's a quote there from an academic, Goffman, and uh, the quote is, to display or not to display, to tell or not to tell, to let on or not let on, to lie or not to lie, and in each case, to whom, how, when and where. So that seems to be what you're saying there in regards to that constant decision making. Absolutely. And it's the case, isn't it, that in relation to coming out, it, it's not just once that someone comes out uh, in the workforce, for example, but if there's new colleagues or there's a new event, et cetera. So it's maybe multiple times that that needs to occur. That's correct. So it's across different workplaces. Um, you know, it's not just workplaces, though. It's someone's whole life where they're navigating these, um, I guess, really difficult communications around if they're safe or not to actually share about their, the different parts of themselves. And um, what we've heard from some of the research we did in our project is that people with disability, they see themselves sometimes as a burden to an employer. There are many things to potentially disclose if they choose to. And there are different needs that might need to be met in an employment context. So it's really sometimes about making choices around disclosing one thing over another. And just picking up on that issue, I'll, I'll come back to Ms. Bath, but just picking up on that issue of burden, um, Ms. Morgan, we've heard evidence today um, from a young man who um, has a significant physical disability and he was explaining that with that disability, he felt like he had a burden. But is it that you're saying that people that also have a disability with LGBTI and that identity, that that's compounding the issue of that feeling of being a burden on an employer? Absolutely, um, that's correct. I think it's important to say also that people don't always have the capacity to be open about their sexuality at work, in addition to being open about their disability. And we do have to also recognise that um, to disclose or not to disclose sometimes isn't a choice for people. Um, so it is quite complicated. There are very um, diverse experiences across the LGBTIQ spectrum, as well as across the disability space as well. So that needs to be acknowledged. And, and just with that, would that be, for example, um, uh, for example, a trans person or transgender that perhaps can't pass off as their identified gender? Is that what you're talking about there? Yeah, that could be the case. Or someone with a physical disability, where it's evident they do have a disability. Um, you know, you don't get to choose. But there are many also invisible disabilities. So people sometimes mask their symptoms and they're having to maybe just endure the conditions of a workplace that might not be um, suitable to them, which has mental health out outcomes. So is it what we... And we've heard a little bit about invisible disability and we've touched on that and we've got visible disability. But the same seems to be the case in the LGBTI community in the sense that we've got invisible identity and then we've got visible identity 
And it's that interplay of how that might roll out in the workplace and the acceptance of those people in the workplace. Yeah, absolutely. Um, even for myself, I identify as queer, but certainly I'm viewed by society as heterosexual for the most part. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I perhaps wouldn't attract as much stigma and discrimination in the first instance. So then also for myself, then I'm wondering, okay, how much do I say? When do I tell people? When is that environment safe? So yeah, there's really individual um, components that need to be considered. And it it, it's not just one, um, I guess, um, you know, lens that you can apply. Everyone has different circumstances and there's different levels of privilege within each of those communities as well. Okay. And when we were talking about um, invisibility or visibility and the concept of burden, um, is it your experience from dealing with those people in the Employable Q Toolkit and the development of that that there was, and I think you may have referred to it as it's tiresome of, do I make this decision? Do I tell them about my disability or do I tell them about my I, I, um, identity? Do I tell them about both? So it's that decision-making and constant mental chatter um, that people are going through. Is that right? That's right. And I was actually um, speaking to one of the co-design team members recently who wanted me to put forward to the commission that they've actually experienced what they described as almost post-traumatic stress disorder from having to go from job to job to job and encountering those barriers of discrimination. Um, for this person, they don't even feel that they are able to talk about their themselves being LGBTI because they're just constantly navigating and they're feeling quite traumatised by the process of having to do this time and time again. Mm -hmm. All right. I'd like to move now, if we can, to the Employable Q um, Toolkit, Inclusion Toolkit. Um, perhaps briefly, if we can, just tell the commissioners what it's about. And if um, either Miss Bath or Miss Morgan, if you want to just tell us a little bit about what it, what it is. So, yes, um, I can talk to the outline and um, Hannah will be able to go into great, uh, much greater detail. Thank you. So the Alliance entered into a partnership with Disability Employment Australia and we applied for an ILC grant. And so it was an NDIS funded project called, as you say, Employable Q. And it provides, um, the focus for the project was to be able to skill up LGBTI health organisations in being able to better engage with and employ um, LGBTI people with disabilities. So the outcome really from that project was to increase economic participation for LGBTI people with disability. The, there was a co-design co team that was established to ensure that all of the resources reflect the needs of people who are both LGBTI and who live with, uh, have the lived experience of disability. And out of the project, um, and as you have said, uh, launched in uh, November was the Employable Q Disability Employment Inclusion Toolkit. Thank you. And we'll come to the toolkit shortly, but I'm interested as to what was the impetus of, of actually starting this project, of seeing that we, there's, there was a need, was there, that you felt? Well, sort of sitting um, in my role at the Alliance, I certainly recognise that this is an area that we need to ourselves work in within and also recognizing that for many of our members, our full members, the LGBTI community controlled health organizations who are often quite poorly resourced, this sort of resource would enable them to undertake different types of recruitment practices which were are more in line for us to be able to engage with and employ LGBTI people with disability. So it was certainly needs driven from experience and needs driven from being able to support our members, which is our role as a peak. And recognizing that um, you know, employment is a key issue for many across um, our communities and certainly for members of our communities with disability. And we'll go to the, uh, the toolkit shortly, but is it something that other um, employers not necessarily LGBTI organisations could have a look at and be uh, used as a resource? Look, absolutely. I think the tools are very transferable outside of the LGBTI health, set, uh, health um, organisation settings. One thing I would just note with regards to that um, 
uh, the transferable nature of those tools is that we would advise for um, cultural <coughs> training to also sit around that for employers around making um, employment um, and workplaces safe for LGBTI people. Uh, it's a, the tool really focuses on much more on disability rather than um, looking at LGBTI um, issues per se. So I do think there's that added kind of layer um, that needs to occur. Um, and one of the reasons that I say that, and it's um, an issue that also comes back around the discussions that we've been having so far around intersectionality and that notion of risk assessment that happens in the areas of all of our lives, but work needs to be a safe place. Um, we spend most of our time at work and at work I think we have our guards down much more than if we were in sort of like public places that we knew were unsafe and it's important to say that even for resilient organizations like ourselves with relative you know we're quite a resilient bunch here at the alliance we live in a kosher environment and we're actually experiencing um, some issues for some of our staff with regards to things that are being said to them, the way that they are being looked at in the environment that we're working in. And so those practices of the cultural safety in the workplace are really, really important um, so that people feel safe and able to bring themselves to, to work. And I think, well, if that's our experience, given who we are, you know, within organisations whereby this isn't part of the wallpaper, that these are even more complex issues. Mm -hmm. And as an organisation, I understand that you really learnt some things out of this process. Um, and one of the examples was in relation to disability employment services. And this th th that's actually um, something that can be utilised by an organisation like yourself. Is that right? Absolutely. I think we have learned a great deal, even um, very, what I think are basic things that we um, have been able to do better most recently in some recruitment rounds or even thinking about how we've written um, job adverts and a whole range of um, things that really should have been um, enveloped as best practice in recruitment for our organisation. So it's been a, a really significant and um, much appreciated learning curve internally as well as the development of those. So we're using those resources and the kits internally. Um, and just yesterday, we were talking about how we delve into that more deeply and share our learnings as we go on that journey. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested, you saw a need, um, you applied for the grant and you did that and that was organisational driven. And I'm just wondering um, in relation to data and the intersection issue in regards to LGBTI people and people with a disability, and perhaps, Mr. Camasoli, you could um, address this just in regards to the data that's available of people suffering a disability who also identify as LGBTI community. And I understand there's limited data, but perhaps you can just tell us a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so I was just going to start my answer by saying there is limited data and research evidence around the experiences of LGBTI people with disability. I, I would just say that it's an ongoing issue um, for us, the, um, access to robust, accurate, timely data. Um, and, but despite that limited data and research, it is clear that LGBTI people with a disability experience worse employment outcomes. And uh, they are more likely to have no employment, less likely to have full employment and tend to have lower incomes. Um, but just speaking more broadly, uh, we do have a real lack of national population data collection with relevant LGBTI data indicators. And that's really unfortunate because that data can actually be used to inform service delivery and planning. And what we see is that we act LGBTI people are not counted in the national census. And that's really difficult for us because we actually don't have a clear picture of how many LGBTI people and LGBTI people with disability are in Australia. And that has a flow on effect. And what we see is that we don't have those indicators in the ABS survey of disability, ageing and carers, and also the standardised uh, disability flag for mainstream services. And so mm -hmm. the Alliance is really calling for um, a more inc LGBTI inclusive data collection practices because these uh, currently these inadequate data collection practices, they perpetuate this cycle of invisibility. And mm -hmm. as data informs evidence-based policy, 
the ex, uh, this exclusion of LGBTI people with disability can actually lead to adverse public policy outcomes that mm -hmm. fail to address the unique needs and experiences of LGBTI people with disability. And just finally, I think, as articulated in our submission that we provided, I think together with an LGBTI inclusive um, ABS survey and census, that will really help build a better picture of LGBTI people with disability in Australia, including their employment outcomes. And it'll just help us understand the intersectional needs of LGBTI people with disability more fully in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Ms Morgan, I might ask you, I mean, the lacking of the data, but you actually had the opportunity of working with those 25 people with lived experience with disability. And I'm just wondering if you can perhaps give us some um, idea as to perhaps, for example, just two or three primary issues that you saw that these people faced, what were the challenges that they had? Yeah, certainly. I think um, primarily it's about accessing jobs. So the recruitment piece was a huge piece for people. Um, you know, um, certainly there were um, lots of discussions around simple things that organisations can do, which make recruitment um, a safer um, experience for people. And that's things like looking at alternatives to traditional interview processes um, and also, also being quite explicit um, when you're advertising for jobs around um, what's what we can offer in terms of access and inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing I think is about creating that culture of inclusion. So what we heard time and time again is really the onus is always on the person with a disability or who's from LGBTI to actually educate others. Um, and that is incredibly tiresome. Um, and people then decide not to ask for what they need because they do need employment and they will forgo actually getting um, basic access needs met. So um, that's probably one of the second key issues. Um, another issue I think that was raised that's quite important is around the fact that there's a lot of work out there around disability inclusion, particularly in the workplace. And um, what they really said to us was that, don't be tokenistic. Don't just um, adopt these templates, adopt um, these toolkits in a way that isn't thoughtful, that isn't consultative. You really actually need to bring a co-design process into developing some of this work within organisations. And that actually takes a lot of time. Um, it requires organisations to take the onus and actually get training in. And it's really important that people with disability in organisations don't carry the burden of having again to actually educate others in that space. So mm -hmm. um, they were some of the issues that came up. Thank you. Um, I'm interested, and as I understand it, um, in regards to there are tools out there um, but in relation to LGBTI um, toolkit, why specifically for this community? So why couldn't you just adopt another um, tool that may be available? Why did you feel the need to have a specific toolkit for the LGBTI community? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. And there's a couple of different reasons. So it's really important for people to actually see themselves in the resources. They see that they're represented they can relate to the stories that are told or the case studies that are used. Um, and also importantly, that um, there are resources and tools that also are providing inclusive language. So, um, you know, if, you, if you're reading stories or um, looking at, um, you know, the various tools out there, you don't really see how they can directly apply to you. They're not relatable and they're not as relevant. Um, and there's just like a real need for cultural competency around this intersection. And um, it's important to note, this is not the only intersection. And, um, you know, you might be someone with a disability who's LGBTI, who's also um, a person of colour. So there are so many different variances and things to consider. Um, but I guess this was the scope of um, the project work that we did do. Thank you. Um, Ms Morgan, just in regards to the, the development of the toolkit, um, I understand that you had workshop sessions and you talked about the experiences um, with people that were living with a disability and LGBTI and that there was a review of a number of resources 
um, as I understand it, and looking at um, guidance on changes and improvement and accessibility checking. So there was a whole process behind this toolkit and it brought those people along with you um, as part of that co-design. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. It was, we had a year to do the project and, you know, overall we spoke to, I think, over 100 different people around this issue. So we had our established co-design team whom we met with regularly. We ran roundtable discussions. We did one-on-one -on -one consultations for people who weren't able to perhaps engage in a longer process of co-design. We spoke with LGBTI organisations, disability employment services. We also ran a survey to find out more about um, what people who work in LGBTI organisations think would be helpful. Um, so all that work together was really a lot of consultation and also coming back regularly to the co-design team to check, to see, is this sounding right? Does this seem like a, a good approach? Um, so, yeah, and also consideration of accessibility and ensuring that the work that we do is accessible. And that was throughout the project, actually, that all the communications were actually accessible and the opportunities um, were accessible to actually get involved in the project. Sounds like it was an incredibly co collaborative approach and task over that 12-month period. I think what we'd like to do now is actually go to the website with the employable queue, and we might bring that up on the screen. And we'll go to the four pillars and just discuss a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Um, so so yeah. this is the, the website. And if we go down, we'll scroll right down to the bottom of the page in the first instance, and we'll go to the four pillars. So, yeah, I can speak to the four pillars and how they but came If you out. can just bri briefly speak to the four pillars. And then I thought what we might do is play the video and then we'll come back to the four pillars. So perhaps just give a brief introduction to the four pillars. We'll play the video and then we'll come back to those four pillars. Great. So these are the four pillars, um, the four areas that we identified as being very important to creating workplaces that are safe and inclusive. So pillar one is creating a culture of inclusion. Pillar two, feeling safe in the workplace. Pillar three, accessible recruitment. Pillar four, access and adjustments at work. Okay, and it's the case that there's a whole lot of tools behind each of those and we'll come back. But if we can scroll up the screen a little bit now and I ask the operator if we could please play the video. I think this toolkit will help employers just learn Firstly, just how many barriers already exist that are stopping people with disabilities from being able to get through the door, let alone be recognised and work and be able to contribute as fully as everybody else in the space. It's all about shifting perceptions and ideals and, and even changing how someone can perceive someone. It'll allow them to go from, oh, we should probably employ these people because it's the right thing to do to um, these people are, you know, these uh, employees are great assets to the team. We know how to include them. You need to practice what you preach. Like if, if you're talking about inclusion of LGBTI plus people, then that needs to include everyone and that includes people with disabilities. Despite best intentions, many workplaces are struggling to be inclusive and accessible to LGBTI plus people with disabilities, with many unaware of the scope of the problem. Which is why we've created the Employable Q Toolkit, a non-prescriptive set of resources to help you make your workplace the inclusive, welcoming and safe space you know it can be. Built upon the four pillars of inclusion, safety, recruitment and accessibility, and co-designed by a group of dedicated LGBTI plus people with disabilities. The Employable Q Toolkit makes accessibility accessible for new and existing employees within your organisation and helps to break down barriers so that LGBTI plus people with disabilities can find work and so that you can find your next great employee. By gearing your recruitment process towards inclusivity and accessibility, and by regularly checking in with your staff's needs, not only will you attract more applicants, you'll encourage existing staff to bring their whole self to work, creating a better workplace and world for everyone. 
when you're a disabled person and you're LGBTI+, you're going to have both sets of marginality that interplay with your movement through everyday society and that's also going to occur in the workplace. By using this toolkit, I believe organisations are really sending a message that they want people like me there and that they, they think we're worthy and they think that we deserve to be able to connect with our peers and with the broader LGBTIQA plus community. It's important to feel safe to bring your whole self to work because if you can't, you're not going to bring your best self to work. Your whole self is your best self. We will be able to fit, fit in well. We would be able to fit in well. We will be able to have someone like, like me. It's easier than you might think, and more important than you might realise. Start by downloading the Employable Q Toolkit today. If we can just go back to the website briefly, please. Thank you. And we just scroll down to the four pillars. Um, when there was reference to downloading the Employable Q Disability Employment Inclusion Kit, Commissioners, I just note that um, document 9.17.1 is that toolkit and it's about 207 pages, but online it's accessible by just clicking basically onto one of the pillars and I thought we might just do that very briefly. Um, if the operator can please click onto pillar four, which is access and adjustments at work, please. And just to scroll down the page a little bit, please. And so what that does is takes to other links and what we might do is click on to uh, 4.2, please. And just scrolling up a little bit, please. Miss Morgan, this particular tool, so it's the ability, isn't it, that employers can go into each of those pillars and bring up resources that they can use in the workplace. Is that right? That's correct, yes. And and this is an example of that particular, um, so in relation to index for access, um, and there's a number of different tools and examples. And so just looking at the accessible documents, if we can just zoom into that a little bit, please. And so what we can see there is how to implement the adjustment. So there's tips and tools about that, but then there's also costs and funding of imp implementation, et cetera, for that. And that's just one small example of the sorts of tools that are available in that 207 page document. Is that right? That's correct. Excellent, all right. Now, I, I guess um, that would be helpful if we could take that off the screen, please, and just return to our witnesses. I want to conclude with you, Miss Bath, as to where to now. Um, you've got this resource, it's been launched, it's out there with the LGBTI community. What's the plan for it? So, um, well, two, two sort of responses to that, I suppose. One is the implementation from the Alliance's perspective and um, sharing that journey with others as we do that so that we can encourage uptake of the toolkit. Um, we will be looking for um, additional ongoing funds to, um, implement, to, you know, to encourage people to implement the toolkit, but we also need to evaluate it and make sure that that evaluation is really rigorous um, to see how it's working. And then there's that issue that we touched on earlier around broader rollout of how that can be a transferable product given the um, you know the time and energy that's gone in there uh, to, to, be, to allowing and get, getting other um, sectors and employers uptaking um, and using the resource. I think, um, as I said before, though, we really need to mark that for that toolkit, the employable tool, employable Q toolkit to be used by other, in other sectors, there really is a need for that cultural safety, uh, inclusive practice training um, to sit uh, for those organisations. I, um, and I think there's like an ongoing other piece of work that we need to do around, um, how do we get consistency and funding to support LGBTI people with disability through NDIS plans, et cetera, that high level advocacy work that we need to be doing. And of course, you know, how all of this sits then within the new um, disability strategy that um, will, be will be coming our way. 
Excellent. Thank you. That brings me to the conclusion of the questions that I had for you. So I'm very, very grateful for the time and energy and efforts that you've put into providing your evidence today. I'm going to hand back to the chair to see if the commissioners have any questions for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start with Commissioner Galbally and ask if uh, Commissioner Galbally has any questions. Um, no questions, but thank you very much. Um, I really found that very valuable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Atkinson? No, thank you. I've got the website up on the screen and it's uh, very user-friendly. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Ryan? No, no, thank you. Mr Chair, I too will have a good look at the website. I think that's most informative. Thanks for being here. Uh, being something of a Luddite, I like to have things in hard copy, and I think what I've got is one of the exhibits in hard copy. I'm just interested, uh, I'm looking, for example, at a document that is headed Employable, Engaging with Disability Employment Services, and it explains pathways uh, to, to or from DES, Disability Employment Services. Was that something, is that text on those issues, is that something developed by you or was it something taken from um, another publication or in collaboration with someone? I ask because it actually seems to be quite a clear exposition of some of the general principles that I've been quite anxious to understand. Yeah, we worked in collaboration with um, Matchworks, which is a disability employment service, to develop that resource. And so it was, yeah, a collaboration with them and they guided us around um, what to include in that and also provided very generously case studies for us as well, which actually captured the experience of, of LGBTI people. So you, you insert it into uh, the general proposition, some examples uh, specifically relevant to the LGBTIQA plus community. That's correct. And the same thing I take it can be said for the document uh, which is headed access and adjustment request form uh, that uh, contains... Um, I think it's that document that contains some quite detailed information on what job access can fund. So that was done in the same way, was it? Yes, um, with research and consultation with other people from the disability sector as well. So a consultation process was quite broad and we tried to integrate all that feedback into that document. Yeah, well, that provides some uh, very useful information on what job access can actually provide. Speaking for myself, it's the first time I've seen it uh, presented that way, and it's very clear. Uh, thank you very much for giving evidence. Um, we appreciate uh, your work and uh, also your willingness to assist uh, the Royal Commission. So thank you very much for coming today. Uh, well, thank you on behalf of us all for having us here today and to shine a light on this fun, this really important part of our communities. And thank you very much for your time and for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Eastman. Uh, commissioners, we'll just have a short break for about five minutes and return with our final witness for the day. Yes, we'll take that break for uh, five minutes. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. The Royal Commission is now resumed. Yes, Ms. Eastman. Uh, our final witness today is Dr. Lisa Stafford, and I'll just check whether she's made she her way into the hearing room. She's on her way. Okay. We'll just wait until Dr. Stafford comes on screen. There she is. Ah. Good afternoon, Dr. Stafford. Good afternoon, Dr. Stafford. Thank you very much for uh, coming to give evidence to the Royal Commission. I know that uh, you were in Tasmania. Just so you are aware of uh, the arrangements that we have in place uh, in uh, the uh, remote age, um, we have uh, Commissioner Atkinson is in the Brisbane hearing room. Commissioner Galbally, whom you can see on screen, at least I hope you can, is in Melbourne. 
Commissioner Ryan is with me in the Sydney hearing room and Ms Eastman, who will ask you some questions, is also in the Sydney hearing room. Let's do oats and questions yes. first. Yes, if you would be good enough, please, Dr Stafford, to follow the instructions of my associate, she will administer the affirmation to you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Stafford. Now, uh, Ms. Eastman will ask you some questions. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Stafford. Can I confirm that you are Lisa Stafford? Yes, that's correct. And your uh, professional address has recently moved from Queensland University of Technology to Tasmania, is that right? Yeah, I'm still at QUT, but yeah, just location change. Mm -hmm. And um, you are a social scientist? Yes. A, a social community planner, a human geographer with 20 mm -hmm. years specialisation in disability inclusion in policy, environment, infrastructure and services with a particular focus on children with disability. Yes, that's correct. And you hold a, a Doctor of Philosophy and your thesis was the journey of becoming involved, the experience of participation in urban spaces by children with diverse mobility and that doctorate was conferred in December 2013. Yes, that's correct. And can you tell the Royal Commission a little bit about what your particular areas of research have been following your doctorate? Um, so following my doctorate has continued in a similar area in terms of looking at, I suppose, the intersection between the social and environmental impacts on um, people with disabilities and particularly children and young people with disabilities in terms of their participation in everyday aspects of life. Um, and that includes from education to employment to, um, to everyday participation in terms of having their voices heard in all matters that affect their lives, so um, to be diverse. Uh, the commissioners have in their tender bundle, tender mm -hmm. bundle B, behind tab 12, a copy of an outline of the evidence that you propose to give to the Royal Commission. Mm -hmm. And commissioners, you also have a number of publications that Dr Stafford has kindly provided to the Royal Commission uh, behind tab 13 through to tab 20 in the bundle. So, commissioners, could I ask you to mark the outline of evidence as exhibit 9.18. Yes. And then the uh, documents that accompany the outline, mark them exhibit 9.18.1 to 9.18.8. Yes, thank you, that can be done. Now, Dr Stafford, I think we were planning on having an over an hour and <laughs> I apologise for the truncated it's time. Cute. But it means I'm just going to go straight to the, to the issues, I think. Go so you, you have been um, involved in an ARC grant linkage project and the end, of, end result of that research is the seamless journeys to work for young adults with disability. And that's work that started in 2016 and has continued through to the present time. Yes, that's correct. And the findings of your project was that young people with disabilities do experience unemployment and underemployment. And the current social and employment systems for young people with disability, that those young people face multi systemic barriers to employment that prevent secure work and financial independence as well as the pursuit of work and careers that are dignified, meaningful and promote social connectedness. And your work um, in terms of the research revealed that while young people with disability are keen and motivated to have fair, decent work and pursue careers, 
the education to work transitions, as it unfolds, you describe that transition process as chaos. Mm -hmm. It occurs within, you say, an inhumane welfare to work policy, market-based outcome service systems within the current labour market are precarious work. Mm -hmm. And this leads to conditions for exploitation, violence, abuse of young people with disability. So that's a pretty strong finding. <laughs> so as I said, I'll go straight to the findings. Okay. So I want, to, I want to explore with you this afternoon, how did you reach uh, such findings where yeah. you describe that transition from education to work as chaos mm -hmm. and that the systems are based on conditions that lead to exploitation, violence and abuse of young people. Mm -hmm. Right. So to reach that conclusion, uh, you and some <laughs> colleagues undertook okay. some research and the research had three stages to it. So can I just uh, ask you to describe a little bit about each of the stages and how they unfolded? So stage one. Yeah, so stage one, and I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues, obviously, um, Professor Greg Marston, um, Dr. Amanda Band, um, Beetson and Dr. Marinella Chokoa. Um, as well, because obviously this is all a um, joint partnership and all the amazing research assistants that worked with us during right. this time. <laughs> so I know we don't, I know we don't have a lot of time, but uh, I don't want you to feel rushed. Yeah. And the interpreters are probably going to give me a little signal about slowing down myself. Good. So I'll mm -hmm. go a little bit slower, but can you join me in we'll be on Absolutely. slow pace? Thanks. All right, Absolutely. so stage one. So stage one, what we did was look at, um, and we used a critical policy analysis, what we call it, um, and looked at the welfare to work policy, um, which has probably come up quite a bit, I would imagine, um, and the disability employment policy, and how that intersects um, with, I suppose, the secondary school systems and tertiary education systems. So it was a really um, deep um, policy analysis. We also looked at secondary artefacts such as submissions to the DES reforms that have occurred um, over a long period of time. And we also did interviewing, um, in-depth interviewing with 24 um, frontline workers and managers involved in the DES or in policy related or advocacy roles in that stage one. And uh, did you make any particular findings follow, following stage one, particularly around the policy and uh, legislative framework. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where the chaos fragmented, um, I suppose, is really unfold. And look, and that's not new. This has been identified in a significant amount of studies previously to us. Um, and that's not a just um, a tradition in Australia. It's also shared by other OECD countries in terms of that fragmented transition. Um, and so that was a significant problem. So when it's hard, when you've got state and federal systems like our education, and we've seen through um, already commission, I'm um, sorry, um, inquiries on education, we've already seen how segregated education, but even for many of the young people that we spoke to later on, they were in mainstream schooling and still did not have conversations about careers, having, you know, transition before year 12, um, setting up expectations that, you know, not only work, but you can have careers, there are um, really important stuff. So this isn't happening. Um, and there's a reason range of that it's not just one school or a single school it's the way in which the system actually understands and positions not just people with disabilities but particularly young people with disabilities and one of the key areas is we still see transition as such a narrow um, time space issue when we know that transition takes much more longer it's more complicated because of the type of um, we're now in a precarious work environment we're in a post-industrial economy where knowledge and service industries are key, you know. So we've still got policies that haven't almost caught up to date with what the current situations are, but requiring and mandating people to comply with really stringent, archaic, and what we said was almost indignified and inhumane processes through welfare to work, mutual obligation, um, and these uh, are really, you know, compound the problems. At the same time, yeah, sorry. I might yeah. just ask you a couple of questions there. So <laughs> earlier this week, um, 
we heard some evidence to try to connect the situation perhaps for a young person with intellectual disability leaving school and how and why a young person might transition into um, an ADE or to DSP or to DES and or how does the NDIS fit into all of that if the person is also an NDIS participant? Mm -hmm. And I think our attempts to sort of work through those processes led to perhaps chaos is your word, but, but a great deal of confusion. Absolutely. So one of the issues that comes out of your research is to uh, pinpoint a young person towards those final few years at school and to ask what transitions are available to work and the transitions to work might take that young person into a segregated or closed working environment but it may also take the young person into a system a series of systems that are aimed to achieving employment in open employment but the process of transition through a DES, perhaps through a school leavers program, or perhaps through a DSP program where the person also has to be assessed for their work capacity, mm -hmm. depending on the nature of that person, young person's disability, mm -hmm. there are a number of different avenues and paths that they might have to follow before they'll get to open employment Mm -hmm. or if they've gone down the other pathway, remaining in the segregated closed employment. Have I, I'm trying to, without getting into the myriad of detail, but just give an overview when we're talking about transitions to set some framework. Yeah. How have I gone in explaining that? Look, not too bad, not too bad, I think. But um, I mean, some of the technical stuff about how you're streamed um, and the types of, they call it streaming. So what, if you leave school um, and you weren't picked up in an early school leaver program sort of DES, what you will be doing is you'll have to go through an assessment process, which, um, you know, you've, you've already made mention of the job capacity assessments and, and those sort of things. And that's to determine under that policy what your work capacity is. And people talk about the over eight and then there's the benchmarks over eight and there's different components to that. And so depending on where you sit in terms of someone's external independent assessment of you, where you've got not much control or determination over that, um, you can be streamed into either a DES, so more intensive support, or job active. So if you have over eight, you still will have a mutual obligation, but the mutual obligation in terms of what you have to do in order to actually keep your income support, we call it the stick approach, um, that will depend. So you could, you, a young person, 19, could end up with a 30-hour um, benchmark to have work, 30 hours being you need to um, achieve a 30-hour work outcome. So that in itself is a really complicated process and it's all dependent on this maybe an hour conversation you have with someone who know, don't know you at all, um, who, um, you know, asking some weird questions that if you're a young person and many young people haven't had these experiences of work before because at school it's so hard to get a part-time job there's no support systems so DES can't actually provide support while you're at a secondary school to help you get a part-time job there's no none of that that might change with the NDIS but that certainly isn't what was in the scope of our study at that time um so if you're yeah so if you this is your reality. So it's a really complex stuff. And, and this is why, you know, there's so much research um, that's come out of not just Australia's little, but we've got a lot in the UK that have actually highlighted their serious concerns of work capacity assessments. And so these, yeah, I, yeah. Can I stop, just stop mm -hmm. you on that? Because mm -hmm. when you're talking about work capacity mm -hmm. assessments, you're yeah. looking at a process that assesses the person with disability in terms of their capacity to perform some work. Yeah, if you if don't get the, picked up before. If you're, you're yeah. not otherwise filtered out along the way. On the yeah, system. if you're a recent school and, yeah. and that process of, of doing a work capacity essentially involves a medical assessment 
about a sort of functional capacity to take on different types of work or perform different functions. Is that right? Well, it's not so much a medical, like it's not your your doctor's not writing. It's some external person that may be an allied health professional asking some instrument questions um, of you to determine maybe it's your got work a medic- experience. It's got a medicalised flavour to it, does it not? Oh, absolutely. And it's and it's um, what we call it. It's, it's based on a medical model and it's also based on um, this idea of professionalism where other experts get to tell you what you should and shouldn't do. And that's a serious concern. Um, particularly it contradicts this convention of the rights of people with disabilities and self-determination. And so one of the concerns is that for a young person who's got no experience of workplaces, mm-hmm. and that might be a sort of social, cultural experience of a workplace, mm-hmm. as well as what doing work might mean, that it can be very tricky for a young person going through an assessment to even be able to answer the questions that might be asked of the assessor to then make a reliable uh, conclusion about that person's capacity to work. Is that right? Well, I think it's any person in that situation. I mean, young people are amazing and highly motivated and um, quite good at articulating what they need, but that's Um, according to how it's framed and we still have weird ideas about what work looks like too where it's still old ideas about how work has to be constituted as well so you know for a young person that might be thinking about you know sounding like a startup or something um, more contemporary um, you know when there's uh, different or structured ideas about work that itself can be problematic too not to mention a complete stranger and you know, one of the findings that we found from talking to, um, you know, the frontline workers or managers, particularly in regional areas, their face-to-face is dis- disappearing. So you may have an assessment by phone by a complete stranger. Um, I don't know any of us in this room would actually how we would feel answering those questions, let alone the seriousness of what that can determine. Mm-hmm. If you're under eight, it can write you off. And if you're over eight or given a 30-hour, it could set you up to fail. Um, and so... You know, and even the the DES reform acknowledged these issues back in 2016, that there was concerns with um, how the assessments were happening. So, and the type. So, yeah, it is, it's known. Um, And, you know, if people want to know more, there is well-established, you know, data that's out there. All right, let's move to stage two. So uh, stage two was that that was completed last year and into early, the early part of this year. Is that right? No, the year before, I think, the years of merging, aren't they? <laughs> so um, after this year, it's sort of gone a blur. Yeah, no, that was, I think, 218 by um, Dr. Amanda Beetson left, led that stage. Mm-hmm. And that stage two involved doing a survey of 200 young people with primary physical and neurological disabilities. Yeah. And so that the purpose of the survey was what? Um, so for all our whole project, we did focus in on physical and neurological because there is so little, little research that's out there um, in, for those scopes. And also recognising that we don't just fit nice and neatly into those categories either. Um, you know, we have then dual disabilities and intersecting um, needs. So, But that was our primary focus, so hence why that we the survey targeted that area of physical. But a lot of people did also have dual um, conditions as well. But... Yeah, the idea was actually to start hearing the young people's voices. So we had the frontline workers, we had the managers, CEOs, advocacy and all the policy. Now it's about understanding what people's own lived realities and experiences were. Um, And so the survey sort of gave um, an overview, um, looking at a whole range of different factors that we've talked about that was identified from stage one. Um, But also looking at... um, we also have qualitative responses. And so the submission that we've submitted actually has pulled out some of that stuff, um, some of that really rich, I suppose, to qualify what does it mean to actually um, that a, a young person wants a DES provider to have a better attitude about display. So we're able to qualify some of those outcomes as well. And uh, I'll ask you some questions about that in a moment, mm-hmm. but just mm-hmm. to finish the three stages, what did the yeah. final and third stage involve? Mm-hmm. So the final stage did a really deep, what we call phenomenological research, where it's a small cohort of people and really mapped the detailed stories, taking people from 
secondary school all the way through to the contemporary situation about the intersecting processes and what they have exposed, been exposed to and experienced. And importantly, a lot of what people have done to work around the systems um, or create their own pathways against um, the, the, a lot of the barriers that they have encountered. So I want to now move to some of the system levels practice that mm -hmm. you found can give rise to exploitation, violence and abuse. Mm -hmm. And there's some interesting expressions which we've seen in some of the material that uh, has been available to the Royal Commissioners thus far, but I'm going to get into some of this language. Yes. So um, one aspect of the, the looking at the system level practice was that your research identified that across the stages of the research that you did, you saw marketised outcomes mm -hmm. based in service models that then resulted in particular practices, a churn, mm -hmm. a creaming or a parking and also bulk service delivery. So can I take each of these expressions? Yeah, absolutely. Right, let's, let's talk about creaming. What does that mean? I should, well, creaming parking um, usually sorry, is together. Can I, can I just interrupt? Is this in paragraph 16 of your statement that you refer to those, the outline of evidence? Mm. Where well, you talk about churning, creaming and parking? Um, what point is that? Sorry, what number? Paragraph 16 of your outline of evidence? Yes, yes, oh, correct. Cool. Thank you. Correct. And it's also um, articulated in the stage one report and also um, the couple of publications as well. So perhaps if, um, if it helps the commissioners in the documents that you've got, and this, um, I might use this as a little bit of a structure for this afternoon. You have a document behind tab 14 in the tender bundle, mm -hmm. which is the submission that Dr. Stafford provided to with others to the Royal Commission on the 14th of August. And if you turn to uh, the page number, which I'll just use the content manager document page number, which is D20 slash 43146. That may help the commissioners just, and I'll use this to, to walk through the concepts of creaming, parking, uh, churning and bulk service delivery. That helps the commission. And while you're yeah. there, phenomenological ideographic accounts. Yes. Um, so it I'm, just. I'm sure senior council knows what that means, but uh, some of us uh, need enlightenment. No, look, it just means um, it's people's, um, it's a deep, in a deep um, sort of discussion and conversation that actually tries to understand not just what people have experienced, but how they actually make sense of their own experiences. Um, that's really important because we all know our, what we experience can be really different to other people's experiences. So um, when we're trying to understand meaning and impact that it's actually understood from people's own lived experiences and their own interpretations, not us putting an interpretation over it, making an assumption. Thank yeah. you. Um, Ms. Eastman, it would help me if you told me what exhibit number that is. Just give me a moment. The reference to phenomenological idiography. Oh, no, no, not that. The document not that that, um, that uh, Ms. Eastman wants us to look at. Um, it's the submission, yes. It is exhibit 9.18.2. Nine Thank you. It's behind tab 14 in the tender bundle. Mm -hmm. and, and the page reference again, sorry. The, the, the document itself is not paginated. There are some um, uh, yeah. pagination in the top right-hand corner, which ends yes. with 006, or in the right. top left-hand corner, 43146. Thank you. Uh, okay. Dr. Yes. Stafford, let's get, let's get back to, I think, where we were, which is, uh, the expression creaming, yeah. what does that mean in the context of a young person uh, transitioning to work? Well, it actually could be the, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say it can actually be any adult, um, a person with a disability. Um, that in, And this concept is not new to this study. It's actually a well-accepted language and concern, not just here in Australia, but in our other 
OECD countries. So, and essentially what it is, it's about, and particularly in a market environment that's based on outcomes and outcomes according to benchmarks and we pay on those, it puts pressure into the system. So um, the reality is um, what people talk about is the practice of creaming involves working with individuals most closely to work. Okay. So, so that, it, yeah. So it seems like if you've got a cohort of people with disability yep. and you want to would. find work, mm -hmm. then you look at the practice of creaming is looking at the person who's probably going to be most likely to be employed and who most likely has the collection of skills that makes them attractive to the employer. Yeah. So the, the provider then says, let's get that person into work. And so this selection of those who are perceived, whether justifiably or not, are going to have the priority in terms of placements of jobs and job opportunities. Is that broadly what creaming means? Yeah, and based on the type of work that's available at the current time. Um, in, so in that's a, always in its context. In Australian terms, it's getting mm -hmm. paid for low-hanging fruit. Yeah, exactly. That's what it means. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, or skimming the cream off the milk. That's the other one. Uh, <laughs> parking. Yeah, and so what happens is, so if you the people who are the furthest away from being ready to be placed or um, employable, if that's the words they use, um, according to this rigid system, let's put it that way, because that's not always the case. Um, then, yeah, you're sort of parked. Or for people with more complex issues and some of the young people the, which we did the detail storing with certainly experienced parking. Um, is, this, is this because the system does not build in an incentive mm -hmm. to assisting uh, people with disabilities who may present as difficult to find particular jobs or to place? Well, it's the, the different iterations that have happened over DES. You know, it's been tinkered around and reformed that many times. Um, and at the moment, it's so much based on outcomes because one of the problems was they were worried about people being churned through the system, so being placed and not um, kept in the job for long and then coming back into the system. So they've shifted on outcomes that way. But that means that there's not a lot of support to be going into early days, particularly if it's as a provider and stuff like that, to doing the intensive work because of the shift and change. So that's one of the complexities. There's also, let's, you know, we've also still got a, a cultural issue around disability. You know, our attitude, the stigmatisation around not just um, disability type, but severity and stuff like that. So, you know, there's a real cultural issue as well. And we can't, it's not just a fix the system, we've actually got to address the attitude um, problem that we have here too, as a society, you know. And the, the um, aspect of churning, Commissioner mm -hmm. heard this earlier in the week, mm -hmm. but churning seemed to be quite a feature of the DES system, particularly if the support for the person with disability was limited to a 26 week period. Yep. So is that, the reason for churning or is there something else in terms of the marketization approach that leads to churning? Well, it's also the fact that we've got precarious employment. Like that's the casualization is a significant issue and we still haven't dealt with that in Australia. We think it's fine. Um, but that leads to insecure um, employment. So if you've got and so I can read some of the stories from the young people. I think that's more powerful than me talking yeah. it. But just an example of the parking. This is one of the young men was talking to us. You know, I went to the employment agency. I explained the idea about his job idea. Second interview with the employment um, agency said it was not worth me getting paid a job because I'd get next to nothing. So this is this is what we're dealing with, you know, and this person had higher support needs, so it didn't sort of happen. Um, the other example... Um, that I just mentioned about the casualization. So I'm just going to flip to um, their accounts because I think that's really important. Is um, you know that you may have a job for three months, uh, but you've been unemployed for another nine months before that, and then you know get excited and then the work dries up, and so that four month contract might end up a two month contract. So this is the reality of what's happening on top of the pressure that our welfare to work policy has on these young people. Um, and so it, this is the reality as well. So it's not just the problem with DES and the churn in terms of the 26 outcome, 
um, in a market base, that's a problem. But we've also got precarious work that leads to a whole range of, um, you know, um, undignified and um, at times even exploitative processes that some of the young people shared with us. So, and, and yeah, sorry. Um, so did you have one of the examples of the young people telling about the experience of churning? Did you want to share that with your commissioners? Yes, I'm trying to find that. As everything tabbed, I apologise for this. Um, one of the, can I, I'll share this one while I find it because I think this is also really important for us to think about if we want to address the systems, systems, I should say. But one of the issues is also around um, choosing work in this precarious employment because the other issue that they've got to deal with is depending on what you're streamed, if you're on Centrelink and the top job seeker what used to be new state, what the young person's doing, if you're streamed into that, you're in a quite serious poverty sort of experience. But then also for another young person, she shared this experience with us. So it's not just about work and thinking about the casual sort of situation, but it's also do I work enough to actually then keep my pension because there's what, what's my safety net? if in three months time, which is my previous experience, I'm losing my job. So I'll read this example. Um, and then the implications on housing. So she talks, yes, because I've got to balance out working enough so I earn enough, but then I've got to also balance out earning under the threshold to keep my pension. And I've also got to balance out earning under the threshold to stay in this unit. Now that's an accessible um, housing um, support unit. Um, because there's like $609 a week limit on how much you can earn, and that's a pension and employment. So it doesn't leave me a lot of options. Yeah, and it, it's also doing hours to satisfy all the requirements of my pension, but not overworking myself as well in terms of her own needs. And then I've got to factor in how far it is and transport costs. So there's all these different variables. Now, this is a 21-year-old talking about what she has to sort of navigate with the policy and programmatic rules that we've created as an Australian society. So that's just an example of the complexities. Um, and transport is a significant issue and it's come up in the survey respondents and it also came up in the own individual stories um, that that's a real issue, particularly for regional areas. Um, and we we don't you know, acknowledge that. Um, so the other um, example about the um, the there's also the devaluation that happens as well in the, um, the ongoing volunteerism where it doesn't lead to a work. That's another issue. So um, that's happening. So in the evidence, there's actually some examples from the young people, I think that was under 32 um, in the submission that actually highlights some of that stuff. So um, just... If you can't find it, I, I can send yeah. it up for you in a moment. Is that all right? Yes, I'm just... Yes, that's um, fine. Can I... I'm just conscious, of, conscious of the time. time. Yes, yes, so <laughs> let's get to... Let's get uh, to how to fix it. <laughs> yes, yeah, so bulk uh, service delivery, which is really just mass movements of young people. Absolutely, the so exactly. Them what we might call job lots. What I wanted to focus on now and, and in conclusion, and thank you very much for the really detailed work that you've done and we've got all of the articles, is you've really been able to encapsulate what the barriers are from a systems-based approach. And you've also looked at those barriers that arise from the welfare to work and then how different schemes themselves create some confusion from the research that you've done I mean where where do we go forward as you say there's been so many reviews of the DES and these systems mm -hmm. is is there a pathway out of this mm -hmm. that make the processes more simple and straightforward and frankly person-centered yeah. for young people seeking to make that transition from school to work particularly work in open employment so what's yeah. your solution to all of this? Well, and I think um, the solutions lie in what people have already done. Some of the young people have already been um, trying to work around the system and have done that. Um, a young man, um, you know, gave a really good example about using his um, 
self, he used to, um, did his own self-directing of funds to actually create his own niche. Um, and the intent, because of the failed system, he was devalued, um, had horrendous situations, um, had done all the training, done cert falls and all this sort of stuff and had two years of demeaning experiences. So decided and was inspired by role models of others um, that he saw and, you know, started creating their own business. And the business wasn't originally about work, money. And this is the thing that we have to really fix in the system is how we conceive work. Um, it's not always just about making money. It's about, you know, a whole range of stuff. And we've heard about identity. We've heard about connectedness and community. And this is what the young people person shared with us. It was about um, them being known as the person, not the guy in the wheelchair. And, and this was a way of doing that. But with self-directed funds, they were able to get a team of people around that believed in the vision and goal and supported that person to achieve that. That's very different from having a sport um, being told, oh, no, this this can do this and th can't do that. Choice and self-determination is what we've got to get sorted. Um, it has to go back to people with disabilities and, um, and it has to be led by people with disabilities in terms of shaping policy and the programming about how that support happens. We have to have fluid systems. We can't keep, and what's happened in the last 20 years since, I, I mean, I used to be a practitioner who worked in government and in post school services, so I have that hat as well. And so, um, you know, the erosion of being able to provide multiple service supports to a person, um, you know, we, we've eroded that and we've siloed everything. Um, if you're getting this, you can't get that. That in itself has created the problems of fragmented and, and chaos that we've seen. Um, it's about actually how we, as I said, perceived work. So why can't we be supporting startups? Why can't people be supported to do self-business if that's their choice? It's also about careers. We have to start talking about career. And a lot of the research shows it has to be early on. And that's what we found in the stage one as well. Um, it can't be just the NDIS because not everyone's eligible for that. But we can learn from that in terms of self-determination or those models, the flexible models, where people are actually behind the driver's seat um, and can determine their work goals, whatever that looks like. But, but that's going to be a long way off. But there are solutions. There are examples. Networks are so important, whether that's peer networks, leadership, supporting people in those leadership roles. There's a whole pathway, but we are so um, outdated with how we understand transition it can't be two years. Like what young person transitions like fully? Um, you know, there may be a few, but not everyone and putting that expectation on everyone, regardless if you have a discipline or not, we know from the youth studies that there's about five different pathways into employment these days in the contemporary environment. So the we have to do that. The concern is, isn't it, that try to fix this. You don't want to see government just replace one narrow no. restricted approach with another. No. And your research has really emphasised the importance of co-design yep. and to take inclusive strategies that really try to break down some of the stigmas, the stereotypes and the misperception about mm. a person with disabilities capacity to work. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And until we deal with the demand side issues, which 30 years of research has shown, um, that we're not going to change the system. If we keep saying, oh, we just got to motivate individuals more, which we've shown that's just ridiculous, that's not, not founded at all, until we deal with that system. But it actually has to be driven by people and young people with disabilities um, because it's they understand the system. Someone can't, and the co-design has to not be token. You know, we've mm -hmm. seen consultation and engagement, how that's gone. Um, it has to be actually authentic and genuine. Um, and government has to be not risk averse um yeah so which is difficult all right i i am um i'm sorry that we've really had to race for it and i feel like i've only just touched the surface of a number of issues but i think the words that you've just used in closing almost mirror uh the evidence that the commission has heard this morning from jess mitchell about the recent summit involving young people and what you say is very much an echo of what came from that summit so I'll just check at this point whether the commissioners have got any uh, questions of you. I know <laughs> that the commissioners have also read the articles accompanying the outline of evidence. So, commissioners, if there's anything arising. I'll ask uh, 
Commissioner Atkinson first. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Commissioner Galbally. Um, uh, it's a big question, and I probably, uh, for this time of day, but I'm interested in, and there might be a way of communicating this, the, the, that self-determination, choice and control, which mm -hmm. is um, the real revolution in Australia, mm -hmm. can you see a way that that could be applied to deaths, which is nowhere near choice and control or self-determination? No, they're completely contradictory. Um, there is, you don't have that choice in terms of, you know, your how long you take, what you do, your choices, your pathways. Um, yeah, it's almost they're, um, opposing. Could it be reformed to be based on that? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't By what we've seen so far, and not just our study, but what other existing studies I'm not sure on the answer. I can't say definitively, but based on the fact of what the values and fundamental philosophy and principles of choice and control and service determination is, um, I hope, yeah, unless it's completely reformed and driven and individualised and flexible and fluid and we address transition issues and work issues, then I'm not sure. How it's, is it just another tinkering exercise? I'm not sure. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan. I have many questions, but today is not enough time to ask, so I think I'll leave. I'll read more and see if I can work it out with what you just said. I have many questions too, uh, but one really follows on from Commissioner Gelber. Mm -hmm. Is the conclusion to be drawn from your analysis that in your view, you think the entire structure of current policies is misconceived and somehow it all has to be thrown out and start again. I mean, that's where it leads to, isn't it? Um, I think we have to learn from experience. Throwing everything out the window doesn't always work either. We've seen that as well. But what, um, may, I ask, <laughs> but yeah. may I ask then what you mean by saying work capacity assessments underpinned by capitalist, neoliberal and medicalised model approach to disability, harmful to the young people's employment pathways and opportunities, mm -hmm due to assumption-driven categorisation of people who are pigeonholed, allocation of unrealistic benchmarks and placed in unhelpful job streams of support. doesn't mm -hmm. really sound like a system that is capable of modification or adaptation, does it? Well, I think, and, and that's probably because we've, we've seen so many types of reform so far and we haven't seen much change in outcomes um, with the different, you know, iterations and stuff that we've already seen. So based on current experience um, that we've we've seen and over the years, um, possibly not. Um, but yeah, um, because of because of all the different multiple factors that have um, that, you know, that we see the complexity the, of the issues, it, they're not just one or two issues, it's a broad systemic problem. Um, and as I've mentioned, this is not just our research. This, is, this has been quite a number of years of research, both here and international, that have highlighted when models come from these frameworks, it can only be um, lead to what we've experienced and what we see um, and what we've continued to see over the Com Royal Commission evidence so far, unfortunately. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, your evidence and your very interesting research uh, papers, uh, which uh, we have read. Um, and uh, we have found your discussion today to be very stimulating and interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. For Thank you, Dr. Stafford. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner, that um, concludes the evidence for today. Thank you for those following along for the extended hour. Uh, but we'll resume again at 9.30 Brisbane time, 10.30 Sydney time tomorrow. Thank you. We'll adjourn to that, to that time. That is just to be clear, 10.30 Sydney time, 9.30 Brisbane time. Thank you. Royal Commission.